Chapter 12, Part 2 of 2, The Guns of Bull Run, A Story of the Civil War's Eve. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Al Rocha. The Guns of Bull Run, A Story of the Civil War's Eve by Joseph A. Altscheller. Chapter 12, The Fight for the Fort, Part 2. It seems to me, said St. Clair to Harry, that while we have taken the fort, we have merely made an exchange. Instead of being besiegers, we have turned ourselves into the besieged. And while I'm expecting everything to turn out for the best, said Langdon, I don't know that we've made anything at all by the exchange. We're in the fort, but the mechanics and the mill hands are on the slope in a good position to pepper us. Or to wait for reinforcements, said Harry. I hadn't thought about that, said St. Clair. They may send up into the mountains and bring four or five times our numbers. Patterson's army must be somewhere near. But we'll hope that they won't, said Langdon. The northern troops ceased their fire presently, but the officers, examining the woods with their glasses, said they were still there. Then came the grim task of burying the dead, which was done inside the earthworks. Nearly two score of the Invincibles had fallen to rise no more, and about a hundred were wounded. It was no small loss even for a veteran force, and Colonel Talbot and Lieutenant Colonel St. Hilaire looked grave. Many of the recruits had turned white, and they had strange, sinking sensations. There was little laughter or display of triumph inside the earthworks, nor was there any increase of cheer when the recruits saw the senior officers draw aside and engage in anxious talk. I'm thinking that idea of yours, Harry, about Yankee reinforcements must have occurred to Colonel Talbot also, said Langdon. It seems that we have nothing else to fear. The Yankees that we drove out are not strong enough to come back and drive us out, so they must be looking for a heavy force from Patterson's army. The conference of the officers was quickly over, and then the men were put to work, building higher the walls of earth and deepening the ditches. Many picks and spades had been captured in the fort, and others used bayonets. All, besides the guard, toiled two or three hours without interruption. It was now noon, and food was served. An abundance of water in barrels had been found in the fort, and the men drank it eagerly as the sun was warm and the work with spade and shovel made them very thirsty. The three boys, despite their rank, had been taking turns with the men, and they leaned wearily against the earthwork. The clatter of tools had ceased. The men ate and drank in silence. No sound came from the northern troops in the wood. A heavy, ominous silence brooded over the little valley, which had seen so much battle and passion. Harry felt relaxed, and for the moment, nerveless. His eyes wandered to the new earth, beneath which the dead lay, and he shivered. The wounded were laying patiently on their blankets and those of their comrades, and they did not complain. The surgeons had done their best for them, and the more skillful among the soldiers had helped. The silence was very heavy upon Harry's nerves. Overhead great birds hoovered on black wings, and when he saw them he shuddered. St. Clair saw them, too. No pleasant sight, he said. I feel stronger since I've had food and water, Harry, but I'm thinking that we're going to be besieged in this fort, and we're not overburdened with supplies. I wonder what the colonel will do. He'll try to hold it, said Langdon. He was sent here for that purpose, and we all know what the colonel is. He will certainly stay, said Harry. After a good rest, they resumed their work with pick, shovel, and bayonet, throwing the earthworks higher and ever higher. It was clear to the three lads that Colonel Talbot expected a heavy attack. "'Perhaps we have underrated our mill hands and mechanics,' said St. Clair, in his precise, dandish way. "'They may not ride as well or shoot as well as we do, but they seem to be in no hurry about going back to their factories.' Harry glanced at him. St. Clair was always extremely particular about his dress. It was a matter to which he gave time and thought freely. Now, despite all his digging, he was again trim 
immaculate, and showed no signs of perspiration. He would have died rather than betray nervousness or excitement. I've no doubt that we've underrated them, said Harry, just as the people up north have underrated us. Colonel Talbot told me long ago that this was going to be a terribly big war, and now I know he was right. A long time passed without any demonstration on the part of the enemy. The sun reached the zenith and blazed redly upon the men in the fort. Harry looked longingly at the dark green woods. He remembered cool brooks, swelling into deep pools here and there, in just such woods as these, in which he used to bathe when he was a little boy. An intense wish to swim again in the cool water seized him. He believed it was so intense because those beautiful woods there on the slope, where the running water must be, were filled with the northern riflemen. Three scouts, sent out by Colonel Talbot, returned with reports that justified his suspicions. A heavy force, evidently from Patterson's army, operating in the hills and mountains, was marching down the valley to join those who had been driven from the fort. The junction would be formed within an hour. Harry was present when the report was made, and he understood its significance. He rejoiced that the walls of earth had been thrown so much higher, and that the trenches had been dug so much deeper. In the middle of the afternoon, when the cool shade was beginning to fall on the eastern forest, they noticed a movement in the woods. They saw the swaying of bushes, and the officers, who had glasses, caught glimpses of the men moving in the undergrowth. Then came a mighty crash, and the shells from a battery of great guns sang in the air and burst about them. It was well for the Invincibles that they had dug their trenches deep, as two of the shells burst inside the fort. Harry was with Colonel Talbot, now acting as an aide, and he heard the leader's quiet comment. The reinforcements have brought more big guns. They will deliver a heavy cannonade, and then, under cover of the smoke, they will charge. Lieutenant Kenton, tell our gunners that it is my positive orders that they are not to fire a single shot until I give the word. The Yankees can see us, but we cannot see them, and we'll save our ammunition for their charge. We'll keep down in the trench, Lieutenant Kenton. The Invincibles hugged their shelter gladly enough while the fire from the great guns continued. A second battery opened from a point further down the slope, and the fort was swept by a crossfire of ball and shell. Yet the loss of life was small. The trenches were so deep and so well constructed that only chance pieces of shell struck human targets. Harry remained with Colonel Talbot, ready to carry any order that he might give. The colonel peered over the earthwork at intervals and searched the woods closely with a powerful pair of glasses. His face was very grave, but Harry presently saw him smile a little. He wondered, but he had learned enough of discipline now not to ask questions of his commanding officer. At length he heard the colonel mutter, It is Carrington. It surely must be Carrington. A third battery now opened at a point almost midway between the other two and the smile of the colonel came again, but now it lingered longer. It is bound to be Carrington, he said. It cannot possibly be any other. That way of opening with a battery on one flank, then on the other, and then with a third midway between, was always his, and the accuracy of his aim is, too. Heavens, what an artillery officer! I doubt whether there is such another in either army, or in the world, and he's better, too, than ever. He caught Harry looking at him in wonder, and he smiled once more. A friend of mine commands the northern artillery, he said. I have not seen him, of course, but he is making all the signs and using all the passwords. We are exactly the same age, and we were chums at West Point. We were together in the Indian Wars, and together in all the battles from Veracruz to the city of Mexico. It's John Carrington, and he's from New York. He's perfectly wonderful with the guns. Lord, lad, look how he lives up to his reputation. Not a shot misses. He must have been training those gunners for months. Thunder, but that was magnificent. A huge shell struck squarely in the center of the earthwork, burst with a terrible crash, and sent steel splinters and fragments flying in every direction. A rain of dirt followed the rain of steel, and when the colonel wiped the last moat from his eye, 
he said triumphantly and joyously, It's Carrington, not a shadow of a doubt can be left. Only such gunner as those he trains can plump shells squarely among us at that range. Oh, I tell you, Harry, he's a marvel. He's the wonderful mathematical and engineering eye. The eyes of Colonel Leonidas Talbot beamed with admiration of his old comrade, mingled with a strong affection. Nevertheless, he did not relax his vigilance and caution for an instant. He made the circuit of the fort and saw that everything was ready. The southern riflemen lined every earthwork, and the guns had been wheeled into the best positions, with the gunners ready. Then he returned to his old place. "'The charge will come soon, Lieutenant Kenton,' he said to Harry. "'Their cannonade serves a double purpose. It keeps us busy dodging ball and shell, and it creates a bank of smoke through which their infantry can advance almost to the fort, and yet remain hidden. See how the smoke covers the whole side of the mountain? Oh, Carrington is doing splendidly. I have never known him to do better. Harry wished that Carrington would not do quite so well. He was tired of crouching in a ditch. He was growing somewhat used to the hideous howling of the shells, but it was still unsafe anywhere except in the trenches. It seemed to him, too, that the cannon fire was increasing in volume. The slopes in the valley gave back a continuous crash of rolling thunder. Heavier and heavier grew the bank of smoke over and against the forest. It was impossible to see what was going on there, but Harry had no doubt that the northern regiments were massing themselves for the attack. The youth remained with Colonel Talbot, being held by the latter to carry orders when needed to other points in the fort. St. Clair and Langdon were kept near for a similar use, and they were crouching in the same trench. If everything happens for the best, it's time it was happening, said Langdon, in an impatient whisper. These shells and cannonballs flying over me make my head ache and scare me to death besides. If the Yankees don't hurry up and charge, they'll find me dead, killed by the collapse of worn-out nerves. I intend to be ready when they come, said St. Clair. I've made every preparation that I can call to mind. Which means that your coat must be setting just right and that your collar isn't ruffled rejoined langdon yes arthur you are ready now you are certainly the neatest and best dressed man in the regiment if the yankees take us they can't say that they captured a slovenly prisoner then said st clair smiling let them come on their cannon fire is sinking exclaimed colonel talbot in a minute it will cease and then will come the charge tis carrington's way and a good way Hark, listen to it, the signal. Ready, men, ready. Here they come. The great cannonade ceased so abruptly that for a few moments the stillness was more awful than the thunder of the guns had been. The recruits could hear the great pulses in their temples throbbing. Then the silence was pierced by the shrill notes of a brazen bugle, steadily rising higher and always calling insistently to the men to come. Then they heard the heavy thud of many men advancing with swiftness and regularity. The southern troops were at the earthworks in double rows, and the gunners were at the guns, all eager, all watching intently for what might come out of the smoke. But the rising breeze suddenly caught the great banks of mist and vapors and whirled the whole aside. Then Harry saw. He saw a long line of men, their front bristling with the blue steel of bayonets, and behind them other lines, and yet other lines. It seemed to Harry that the points of the bayonets were almost in his face, and then, at the shouted command, the whole earthwork burst into a blaze. The cannon and hundreds of rifles sent their deadly volleys onto the blue masses at short range. The fort had turned into a volcano, pouring forth a rain of fire and deadly missiles. The front line of the northern force was shot away, but the next line took its place and rushed at the fort, with those behind pressing dose after them. The defenders loaded and fired as fast as they could, and the high walls of earth helped them. The loose dirt gave way as the northern men attempted to climb them, and dirt and men fell together back to the bottom. The northern gunners in the rear of the attack could not fire for fear of hitting their own troops, but the southern cannon at the embrasures had a clear target. Shot and shell crashed into the northern ranks, and the deadly hail of bullets beat upon them without ceasing. 
but still they came. The mechanics and mill hands are as good as anybody, it appears, shouted St. Clair in Harry's ear, and Harry nodded. But the defenses of the fort were too strong. The charge, driven home with reckless courage, beat in vain upon those high earthen walls, behind which the defenders, standing upon narrow platforms, sent showers of bullets into the ranks so close that few could miss. The assailants broke at last, and once more the shrill notes of the brazen bugle pierced the air. But instead of saying, Come, it said, Fall back, fall back, and the great clouds of smoke that had protected the northern advance now covered the northern retreat. The firing had been so rapid and so heavy that the whole field in front of the fort was covered with smoke, through which they caught only the gleam of bayonets and glimpses of battle flags. But they knew that the northern troops were retiring, carrying with them their wounded, but leaving the dead behind. Harry, excited and eager, was about to leap upon the crest of the earthwork, but Colonel Talbot sharply ordered him down. "'You'd be killed inside of a minute,' he cried. "'Carrington is out there with the guns. As soon as their troops are far enough back, he'll open up on us with the cannon, and he'll rake this fort like a hurricane beating upon a forest.' Only the earthworks will protect us from certain destruction. He sent the order, fierce and sharp along the line, for everyone to keep under cover, and there was ample proof soon that he knew his man. The northern infantry had retired and the smoke in front was beginning to lift, when the figure of a tall man in blue appeared on a hillock at the edge of the forest. Harry, who had snatched up a rifle, leveled it instantly and took aim, but before his finger could pull the trigger, Colonel Talbot knocked it down again. My God, he explained, I was barely in time to save him. It was Carrington himself. But he's our enemy, our powerful enemy. Our enemy, our official enemy, yes, but my friend, my lifelong friend. We were boys together at West Point. We slept under the same blanket on the icy plateau of Mexico. No, Harry, I could not let you or any other slay him. The figure disappeared from the hillock, and the next moment the great guns opened again from the forest. The orders of Colonel Talbot had not been given a moment too soon. Huge shells and balls raked the fort once more, and the defenders crouched lower than ever in the trenches. Harry surmised that the new cannonade was intended mainly to prevent a possible return attack by the southern troops, but they were too cautious to venture from their earthworks. The Invincibles had grown many years older in a few hours. When it became evident that no sally would be made from the fort, the fire of the cannon in front ceased, and the smoke lifted, disclosing a field black with the slain. Harry looked, shuddered, and refused to look again, but Colonel Talbot examined field and forest long and anxiously through his glasses. They are there yet, and they will remain, he announced at last. We have beaten back the assault. They may hold us here until a great army comes, and with heavy loss to them, but we are yet besieged. Carrington will not let us rest. He will send a shell to some part of this fort every three or four minutes. You'll see. They heard a roar and hiss a minute later, and a shell burst inside the walls. Through all the afternoon Carrington played upon the shaken nerves of the Invincibles. It seemed that he could make his shells hit wherever he wished. If a recruit left a trench, it was only to make a rush for another. If their nerves settled down for a moment, that solemn boom from the forest and the shriek of the shell made them jump again. Wonderful, wonderful, murmured Colonel Talbot, but terribly trying to new men. Carrington certainly grows better with the years. Harry tried to compose himself and rest as he lay in the trench with St. Clair and Langdon. They had had their battle face to face, and all three of them were terribly shaken. But they recovered themselves at last, despite the shells which burst at short but irregular intervals inside the fort. Thus the last hours of the afternoon waned, and as the twilight came they went more freely about the fort. Colonel Talbot called a conference of the senior officers in a corner of the enclosure well under the shelter of the earthen walls, and after some minutes of anxious talking they sent for the three youths. Harry, St. Clair, and Langdon responded with alacrity, sure that something 
of the utmost importance was afoot. End of chapter 12, part 2 of 2. Recording by Al Roca. Chapter 13, part 1 of 2. Of the Guns of Bull Run, a story of the Civil War's Eve. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. The Guns of Bull Run, a story of the Civil War's Eve by Joseph A. Altshila. Chapter 13 the seeker for help part one colonel talbot lieutenant colonel st hilaire and four other officers were in the deep alcove that had been dug just under the highest earthwork where they were not likely to be interrupted in their deliberations by any fragment of an exploding shell the only light was that of the stars and the early moon which had now come out but it was sufficient to show faces oppressed by the utmost anxiety Three other men also had been summoned to the council. We have chosen you six for an important errand, said Colonel Talbot, but you are to go upon it singly and not collectively. As you see, we are besieged here by a greatly superior force. Its assault has been repulsed, but it will not go away. It will bombard us incessantly, and since we are not strong enough to break through their lines and have limited supplies of food and water, we must fall in a day or two unless we get help We want you to make your way over the hills tonight to general Beauregard's army and bring aid Even should five be captured or slain the sixth may get through Lieutenant Kenton you will go first you will recall that the horses of the officers were left on the crest of the mountain with a small guard They may be there yet and if you can secure a mount so much the better but the moment you leave this fort you must rely absolutely upon your own skill and judgment Harry bowed It was a great trust and he felt elation because he had been chosen first He was again a courier and he would do his best I Should advise you not to take either a rifle or a sword said Colonel Talbot as they will be in the way of speed But you'd better have two pistols now go i send you upon a dangerous errand but i hope that the son of george kenton my old friend will succeed hark there is carrington again how strangely this war arrays comrades against one another a shell burst almost at the centre of the fort and for a few moments the air was full of earth and flying fragments of steel but in another minute harry made his preparations dropped over the rear earthwork and crouched for a little while against it Before him stretched an open space of several hundred yards and here he felt was his greatest danger The northern sharpshooters might be lurking at the edge of the forest and he ran great danger of being picked off as he fled He looked up hopefully at the skies and saw a few clouds, but they did not promise much Starshine and moonshine together gave enough light for a good sharpshooter Bending until he was half stooped he took his chance and ran across the clearing his flesh quivered Fearing the sudden impact of a bullet upon it But no crack of a rifle came and he darted into the protecting shades of the forest He lay a few minutes among the trees until his lungs filled with fresh air then he rose and advanced cautiously up the slope which lay to the south of the fort The besieging force was massed on the northern side of the fort, but it was probable that they had outposts here also To guard against such errands as the one upon which Harry himself was bent Yet he felt sure of getting through one youth in a forest was hard to find The clouds at which he had looked so hopefully were really growing a little heavier now it would take good eyes to find him and swift feet to catch him He paused again halfway up the slope and saw a flash of flame from the northern forest Then came the thunderous roar of one of Carrington's guns all the louder in the still night And he saw the shell burst just over the fort He knew that these guns would play all night on the southern recruits 
allowing them but little rest and sleep and shaking their nerves still further but he must not pause for the guns a hundred yards further and he sank quietly into a clump of bushes voices had warned him and he lay quite still until a northern officer and twenty soldiers passed they were so near that he heard them talking and they spoke of the recapture of the fort within two days at least when they were lost among the trees he rose and advanced more rapidly than before he met no interruption until he reached the crest of the mountain when he almost ran into the arms of a sentinel the man in the darkness did not see the color of his uniform and hailed him for news nothing replied harry hastily as he darted away i carry a message from our commander to a detachment station further on but the sentinel catching sight of his uniform and exclaiming a johnny reb threw up his rifle and fired luckily for harry it was such a hurried shot that the bullet only made his flesh creep and passed on cutting the twigs then harry lifted himself up and ran lifting himself up describes it truly he had all the motives which can make a boy run pressing danger love of life devotion to his cause and burning desire to do his errand hence he lifted his feet spurned the earth behind him and fled down the slope at amazing speed several more shots were fired but the bullets flew at random and did not come near him harry did not stop until he was two or three miles from the fort when he knew that he was safe from anything but a chance meeting with the northern troops then he lay down under a big tree and panted but his breathing soon became easy and rising he examined the region he always had a good idea of locality and soon he found the road by which the invincibles had come no one could mistake the tracks made by the cannon wheels he would retrace his steps on that road as fast as he could he saw that it was useless now to look for the men with the horses fear of capture had compelled them to move long since and a search would merely waste time he tightened his belt squared his shoulders and bending a little forward ran at a long easy gait along the trail he was a strong and enduring youth trained to the woods and hills and with occasional stops for rest he knew that he could continue until he reached the camp at manassas he wondered if the others had got through he hoped they had but he was still anxious to be the first who should reach beauregard an ambition not unworthy on the part of youth he stopped after midnight for a longer rest than usual colonel talbot at the last moment had made him take a small knapsack with some food in it and now he was grateful for his commander's foresight he ate drank from a tiny brook that he heard trickling among the trees and felt as if he had been made anew he wisely protracted his stop to half an hour and then he went forward at an increased gait his flight save for short rests continued without interruption until morning always he looked about for a horse intending in such an emergency to take a horse by force and gallop to beauregard but the country was populated very thinly and he saw none he must continue to rely upon his own good lungs strong muscles and dauntless spirit dawn came bathing the hills in gray light and unveiling the green of the valleys below then the sun showed an edge of red fire in the east and the full day was at hand harry saw below him many horsemen in smooth array they seemed to have just started as a huge campfire a little further up the valley was still burning to the weary and anxious boy it seemed a most gallant command fresh as the dawn splendid horses splendid men overflowing with life and strength and spirits his eyes traveled to one who was a little in advance of all the others and rested there the figure that held his gaze was scarcely modern it was more like that of a knight of old romance he saw a young man tall and built very powerfully riding upon an immense black horse his hair and beard were long and thick of a golden brown that looked like pure flowing gold in the brilliant rays of the young sun his coat had two rows of shining brass buttons down the front 
and was sewn thickly with gold braid heavy gold braid covered the seams of his trousers and a great sash of yellow silk was tied around his waist spurs of gold gleamed in the sun long yellow gloves covered his hands his hat was of the finest felt the brim pinned back with a golden star while a black ostrich plume waved over the crown harry gazed at this singular and striking figure with wonder he had seen in the pictures knights of old france wearing such a garb as this and yet it did not seem so strange here these were strange times everything was out of the normal and the brilliant colors which would have seemed so dandyish to him at other times appealed to him now he suddenly recalled that these men were in gray uniforms and he too wore a gray uniform they were his own people cavalry of the southern army recovering his presence of mind he ran forward shouting and waving his hands the leader was the first to notice him and gave the order to halt the whole command stopped with beautiful precision the ranks remained even then the leader looking more than ever like a medieval knight rode slowly forward on his great black horse to meet the youth who was running to meet him when harry came near he saw that the man was young under thirty he gazed steadily at the boy out of deep blue eyes and his hair and beard rippled like molten gold under the light breeze who are you he asked my name is kenton henry kenton and i am a lieutenant in the regiment of the invincibles commanded by colonel leonidas talbot we were sent to take a fort on the other side of the mountain and took it but the regiment is besieged there by a much larger northern force and i came through in the night for help the man stroked his golden beard and a light leaped up in his eye any dandyish or foppish quality that he might have seemed to have disappeared at once and harry saw only the soldier ah i have heard of this expedition he said and so the invincibles are in a trap we had started on another errand but we will go to the relief of colonel talbot my name is stuart lad j e b stuart and this is my command it was Harry's first meeting with the famous Jeb Stuart, the most picturesque of all the Southern cavalry leaders, although not superior to the illiterate man of genius, Forrest. Stuart inspired supreme confidence in him. His manner, the very brilliancy of his clothes, seemed to say that here was one who would dare anything. We have some extra horses, said Stuart. You shall mount one and guide us. The country is very difficult for cavalry said Harry the slopes are steep and are wooded heavily For ordinary cavalry. Yes replied Stuart proudly, but these horsemen of mine can go anywhere But we will not rely upon cavalry alone I will send two men at full speed to the main army for infantry reinforcements Meanwhile we will hurry forward Mounted on a good horse Harry felt like a new being and his spirits rose rapidly as the whole troop set off at a swift pace He rode by the side of Stuart who asked him many questions Harry saw that he was not only brilliant and dashing but thorough He was planning to relieve Colonel Talbot, but he had no intention of dashing into a trap Soon they were deep in the hills and here they picked up a weary youth dodging about among the trees It was st. Clair he had run the gauntlet, but he had been pursued so hotly that he had been forced to lie hidden in the forest a long time. He had made his uniform look as spruce as possible, and he held himself with dignity when the horseman approached, but he could not conceal the fact that he was exhausted. I congratulate you, Harry, he said, when he also was astride a horse. It is likely that you are the only one who has got through so far. I'm quite sure that Langdon was driven back and I don't know what has become of the others but it was great luck to find such a command as this he looked somewhat enviously at Jeb Stuart's magnificent raiment and again pulled and brushed at his own you cannot expect to equal it said Harry smiling not unless my opportunities improve greatly 
I must say also that the colors are a little too bright for me although they suit him Everything must be in harmony Harry and it is certainly true of Stuart and his uniform that they are in perfect accord Good clothes Harry give one courage and backbone Stuart and his men continued to advance rapidly although they were now deep in the hills and Harry realized to the full that it was a splendid command splendid men and splendid horses led by a cavalryman of genius Stuart neglected no precaution he sent scouts ahead and threw out flankers when they reached the forest the ranks opened out and without losing touch a thousand men rode among the trees as easily as they had ridden in the open fields they reached the crest of the last slope and Stuart sitting his horse with Harry and st. Clair on either side Looked through his glasses at the valley below Our people still hold it he said I can see their gray uniforms and I have no doubt the besiegers are still in the forest Yes, there's their signal The heavy report of a cannon shot rolled up the valley and Harry saw a shell burst over the fort Carrington was still at work playing upon the nerves of the defenders While we have ridden through the forest said Stuart a cavalry charge here is not possible We must dismount leaving one man in every ten to hold the horses Signal to Colonel Talbot that help has come and then attack on foot a Bugler advanced on horseback at Stuart's command blew a long and thrilling call and then another man beside him broke out the immense confederate flag They see us in the fort and recognize us said Stuart hark to the cheer the faint sound of many voices in unison Came up from the valley and Harry knew it to be the invincibles expressing joy that help had come The fort then opened with its own guns and Stuart's dismounted horsemen who were armed with carbines advanced through the forest using the trees for shelter and attacking the northern force on the flank They and the invincibles together were not strong enough to drive off the enemy But the heavy skirmishing lasted until the middle of the afternoon When a whole brigade of infantry came up from the main army Then the northern troops retreated slowly and defiantly carrying with them all their wounded and every gun I've got to take my hat off to the mill hands and mechanics said st. Clair I think Harry that if this hadn't been for your skill and luck in getting through we would soon have been living our lives according to their will Colonel Talbot congratulated Harry, but his words were few lad. He said you have done well Then he and Stuart consulted Harry meanwhile found Langdon who had been driven back as st. Clair had suspected he had also sustained a slight wound in the arm, but he was rejoicing over their final success Everything happens for the best he said you might have been driven back Harry as I was you might not have met Stuart This little wound in my arm might have made a big one in my heart But none of those things happened here. I am almost unhurt and here we are victorious Victorious perhaps but without spoils said st. Clair We've got this fort, but we know it will take a big force to keep it. I Don't like the way these mill hands and mechanics fight they hang on too long After we drove them out of the fort they ought to have retreated up the valley and left us in peace If they act this way when they're raw, what will they do when they are seasoned? After the conference with Colonel Talbot Stuart and his cavalry pursued the northern force up the valley not for attack but for observation Stuart came back at nightfall and reported that their retreat was covered by the heavy guns and If they were attacked with much success it must be done by at least 5,000 men Carrington again said Colonel Talbot smiling and rubbing his hands You and your horsemen Stuart could never get a chance at the northern recruits unless you rode first over Carrington's guns from whatever point you approached their muzzles would be sure to face you The colonel is undoubtedly right about his friend Carrington said st. Clair to Harry and Langdon I guess those guns scared us more than anything else Stuart and his command left them about midnight 
a brilliant moon and a myriad of stars made the night so bright that harry saw for a long time the splendid man on the splendid horse leading his men to some new task then he lay down and slept heavily until dawn they remained in the fort two days longer and then came an order from beauregard for them to abandon it and rejoin the main army the shifting of forces had now made the place useless to either side and the invincibles and their new comrades gladly marched back over the mountain and into the lowlands end of chapter 13 part 1chapter 13 part 2 of 2 of the guns of bull run a story of the civil wars eve this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by lynn thompson the guns of bull run a story of the civil wars eve by joseph a altschiller Chapter 13 the seeker for help part 2 Harry found a letter from his father awaiting him Colonel Kenton was now in Tennessee where he had been joined by a large number of recruits from Kentucky He would have preferred to have his son with him, but he was far from sure of his own movements The regiment might yet be sent to the east There was great uncertainty about the Western commanders and the Confederate resistance there had not solidified as it had in the east Harry expected prompt action on the Virginia field But it did not come the two armies lay facing each other for many days June deepened and the days grew hot off in the mountains to the west There were many skirmishes with success divided about equally So far as Harry could tell these encounters meant nothing their own battle at the fort meant nothing either The fort was now useless and the two sides faced each other as before Some of the invincibles however were gone forever Harry missed young comrades whom he had learned to like But in the great stir of war when one day in its effects counted as ten their memories faded fast It was impossible when a boy was a member of a great army facing another great army to remember the fallen long Although the long summer days passed without more fighting there was something to do every hour New troops were arriving almost daily and they must be broken in Entrenchments were dug and abandoned for new entrenchments elsewhere Which were abandoned in their turn for entrenchments yet newer They moved to successive camps, but meanwhile they became physically tougher and more enduring the life in the open air agreed with Harry wonderfully he had already learned from Colonel Talbot and Lieutenant Colonel st. Hilaire how to take care of himself and He and st. Clair and Langdon suffered from none of the diseases to which young soldiers are so susceptible But the long delays and uncertainties preyed upon them although they made no complaint except among themselves and then they showed irony rather than irritation Sleeping out here under the trees is good said Langdon, but it isn't like sleeping in the White House at Washington Which as I told you before I've chosen as my boarding house for the coming autumn There may be a delay in your plans Tom said Harry I'd make them flexible if I were you I Intend to carry them out sooner or later. What's that you're reading Arthur a New York newspaper? I won't let you see it Tom, but I'll read portions of it to you I'll have to expurgate it or you'll have a rush of blood to the head. You're so excitable It makes a lot of fun of us tells that old joke hay foot straw foot when we drill Says the Yankees now have 300,000 men under the best of commanders and that the Yankee fleet will soon close up all our ports Says a belt of steel will be stretched about us Then said Langdon just as soon as they get that belt of steel stretched We'll break it in two in a half dozen places, but go on with those feats of fancy that you're reading from that paper Makes fun of our government says McDowell will be in Richmond in a month Just the time that Tom gives himself to get into Washington 
interrupted Harry. But go on. Makes fun of our army, too, especially of us South Carolinians. Says we've brought servants along to spread tents for us, load our guns for us, and take care of us generally. Says that even in war we won't work. They're right as far as Tom is concerned, said Harry. We're going to give him a watch as the laziest man among the Invincibles. It's not laziness, it's wisdom, said Langdon. What's the use of working when you don't have to, especially in a June as hot as this one is? I can serve my energy. Besides, I'm going to take care of myself in ways that you fellows don't know anything about. Watch me. He took his clasp knife and dug a little hole in the ground. Then he repeated over it solemnly and slowly. God made man and man made money. God made bee and the bee made honey. God made Satan and Satan made sin. God made a little hole to put the devil in. What do you mean by that, Tom? asked Harry. I learned it from some fellows over in a Maryland company. It's a charm that the children in that state have to ward off evil. I've a great belief in the instincts of children, and I'm protecting myself against cannon and rifles in the battle that's bound to come. Say, you fellows do it too. I'm not superstitious. I wouldn't dream of depending on such things. But anyway, a charm don't hurt. Now go ahead, just to oblige me. Harry and St. Clair dug their holes and repeated the lines. Langdon sighed with relief. It won't do any harm, and it may do some good, he said. They were interrupted by an orderly who summoned Harry to Colonel Talbot's tent. The colonel had complimented the boy on his energy and courage in bringing Stuart to his relief when he was besieged in the fort, and he had also received the official thanks of General Beauregard. Proud of his success, he was anxious for some new duty of an active nature, and he hoped that it was at hand. Langdon and St. Clair looked at him enviously. He ought to have sent for us, too, said Langdon. Colonel Talbot has too high an opinion of you, Harry. I've been lucky, said Harry, as he walked lightly away. He found that Colonel Talbot was not alone in his tent. General Beauregard was there also. You have proved yourself, Lieutenant Kenton, said General Beauregard, in flattering and persuasive tones. You did well in the far south, and you performed a great service when you took relief to Colonel Talbot. For that reason, we have chosen you for a duty yet more arduous. Beauregard paused, as if he were weighing the effect of his words upon Harry. He had a singular charm of manner, when he willed, and now he used it all. Colonel Talbot looked keenly at the boy. "'You have shown coolness and judgment,' continued Beauregard, "'and they are invaluable qualities for such a task as the one we wish you to perform.' "'I shall do my best, whatever it is,' said Harry, proudly. "'You know that we have spent the month of June here, waiting,' "'continued General Beauregard, in those soft, persuasive tones, "'and that the fighting, what there is of it, "'has been going on in the mountains to the west. "'But this state of affairs cannot endure much longer. "'We have reason to believe that the northern advance "'in great force will soon be made, "'and we wish to know, meanwhile, what is going on behind their lines? What forces are coming down from Washington? What is the state of their defences, and any other information that you may obtain? If you can get through their lines, you can bring us news which may have vital results. He paused and looked thoughtfully at the boy. His manner was that of one conferring a great honour, and the impression upon Harry was strong. But he remembered. This was the duty of a spy, or something like it. He recalled Shepherd and the risk he ran. Spies die ingloriously, yet he might do a great service. Beauregard read his mind. We will ask you to be a scout, not a spy, he said. You may ride in your own uniform, and if you are taken, you will merely be a prisoner of war. Harry's last doubt disappeared. I will do my best, sir, he said. No one can do more, said Beauregard. When do you wish me to start? As soon as you can get ready. How long will that be? Your horse will be provided for you. In a half hour. Good, said Beauregard. Now, I will leave you with Colonel Talbot, who will give you a few parting instructions. 
He left the tent, but, as he went, gave Harry a strong clasp of the hand. "'Now, my boy,' said Colonel Leonidas Talbot, when they were alone in the tent, "'I've but little more to say to you. It is an arduous task that you've undertaken, and one full of danger. You must temper courage with caution. You will be of no use to our cause unless you come back. And, Harry, you are your father's son. I want to see you come back for your own sake, too. Good-bye. Your horse will be waiting. Harry quickly made ready. St. Clair and Langdon, burning with curiosity, besieged him with questions, but he merely replied that he was riding on an errand for Colonel Talbot. He did not know when he would come back. But if it should be a long time, they must not forget him. A long time? asked St. Clair. A long time, Harry, means that you've got a dangerous mission. We'll wish you safely through it, old fellow. And don't forget the charm, exclaimed Langdon. Of course, I don't believe in such foolishness. I wouldn't think of it for a minute, but, anyway, they don't do any harm. Good-bye, and God bless you, Harry. The same from me, Harry, said St. Clair. The strong grip of their hands still thrilled his blood as he rode away. His pass carried him through the southern lines, and then he went toward the northwest, intending to pass through the hills and reach the rear of the northern force. He carried no rifle, and his grey uniform, somewhat faded now, would not attract distant attention. Still, he did not care to be observed even by non-combatants, and he turned his horse into the first stretch of forest that he could reach. Harry, being young, felt the full importance of his errand, but it was vague in its nature. He was to follow his own judgment and discover what was going on between the Northern Army and Washington, no very great distance. When he was well hidden within the forest, he stopped and considered. He might meet Federal scouts on errands like his own, but the horse they had given him was a powerful animal, and he had good weapons in his belt. It was Virginia soil, too, and the people generally were in sympathy with the South. He relied upon this fact more than upon any other. The belt of forest into which he had ridden ran along the crest of a hill, where the soil evidently had been considered too thin for profitable cultivation. Yet the growth of trees and bushes was heavy, and Harry decided to keep in the middle of it, as long as it continued northward in the direction in which he was going. He found a narrow path among the trees, and with his hand on a pistol butt, he rode along it. He expected to meet someone, but evidently the war had driven away all who used the path, and he continued in a welcome silence and desolation. Coming from an army where he always heard many sounds, this silence impressed him at last. Here in the woods there was a singular peace. The June sun had been hot that year in Virginia, but in the sheltered places the leaves were not burned. A moist, fresh greenness enclosed him, and presently he heard the trickle of running water. He came to a little brook, not more than a foot wide and only two or three inches deep, but running joyfully over its pebbly bottom. Both Harry and his horse drank of the water, which was cold, and then they went with the stream, which followed the slow downward slope of the hill toward the north. After a mile he turned to the edge of the forest and looked over the valley. He caught his breath at the great panorama of green hills and of armies upon them that was spread out before him. Down there, under the southern horizon, were the long lines of his own people, and toward Washington, but much nearer to him, were the lines of a detachment of the northern army. Between, he caught the flash of water from Bull Run, Young's Branch, and the lesser streams. Behind the northern force, the sun glinted on a long line of bayonets, and he knew that it was made by a regiment marching to join the others. The spectacle, with all the sombre aspects of war, softened by the distance, was inspiring. Harry drew a long breath, and then another. It was in truth more like a spectacle than war's actuality. He counted five colonial houses, white and pillared, standing among green trees and shrubbery. Smoke was rising from their chimneys, as if the people who lived in them were going about their peaceful occupations. 
He turned back into the forest and rode until he came to its end, two or three miles further on. Here the brook darted down through pasture land to merge its waters finally into those of Bull Run. Harry left it regretfully. It had been a good comrade, with its pleasant chatter over the pebbles. Two miles of open country lay before him, and beyond was another cloak of trees. He decided to ride for the forest, and remain there until dark. He would not then be more than fifteen miles from Washington, and he could make the remaining distance under the cover of darkness. He followed a narrow road between two fields, in one of which he saw a farmer ploughing, an old man, gnarled and knotty, whose mind seemed bent wholly upon his work. He was ploughing young corn, and although he could not keep from seeing Harry, he took no apparent notice of him. The boy rode on, but the picture of the grim old man ploughing between the two armies lingered with him. The fence enclosing the two fields was high, staked, and rided, and presently he was glad of it. He beheld on a hill to his right, about a half mile away, four horsemen, and the colour of their uniforms was blue. He bent low over his horse, that they might not see him, and rode on, the pulses in his temples beating heavily. He was glad that grey was not an assertive colour, and he was glad that his own grey had been faded by the hot June sun. Halfway to the protecting wood, he saw one of the men on the hill, undoubtedly an officer, put glasses to his eyes. Harry was sure, at first, that he had been discovered, but the man turned the glasses on Beauregard's camp, and the boy rode on unnoticed, praying that the same luck would attend him in the other half of the distance. End of chapter 13, part 2「Chapter twenty four part one of two of the Guns of Bull Run, a story of the Civil War's Eve. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bill Yatley. The Guns of Bull Run, a story of the Civil War's Eve by Joseph A. Altscheller. Chapter twenty four in Washington. A quarter of a mile from the forest, the wood ascended considerably, throwing him into relief. He felt some shivers here, as he did not know who might be watching him. Field glasses were ugly things when a man was trying to hide. He glanced at the little group that he had seen on the hill, and he noticed now that the officer with the glasses was looking at him. But Harry was a long distance away, and he had the courage and prudence of mind to keep from falling into a panic. He did not believe that they could tell the color of his uniform at that range, but if he whipped his horse into a gallop, pursuit would certainly come from somewhere. He rode slowly on, letting his figure sway negligently, and he did not look back again at the group on the hill, where the officer was watching him. He looked from side to side, fearing that horsemen in blue might appear galloping across the fields. It was a supreme test of nerve and will. More than once he felt an almost irresistible temptation to lash his horse and gallop for the wood as hard as he could. The wood seemed wonderfully deep and dark, fit to hide any fugitive. But it had acquired an extraordinary habit of moving further and further away. He had to exert his will so hard that his hand fairly trembled on his bridle rein. Yet he remained master of himself and went on sitting in the saddle in the slouchy attitude that he had adopted when he knew himself to be observed. The wood was only three or four hundred yards away, when far to his left he saw several horsemen appear on a slope, and he was quite sure that their uniforms were blue. The distance to the wood was now so short that the temptation to gallop was powerful, but he still resisted. Pride, too, helped him, and he did not increase the pace of his horse a particle. He saw the dark and cool shadow very near now, and he thought he heard one of the new horsemen on his left shout to him. But he would not look around. Preserving appearances to the last, he rode into the forest, and its heavy shadows enveloped him. He stopped for a moment under the trees and wiped the perspiration from his forehead. He was also seized with a violent fit of trembling, but it was over in half a minute. And then, turning his horse from the path, he rode into the densest part of the forest. 
Harry felt an immense relief. He knew that he might be followed, but he did not consider it probable. It was more likely that he passed for some countryman riding homeward. Martial law had not yet covered all the hills with a network of iron rules, so he rode on boldly, and he noticed with satisfaction that the forest seemed to be extensive and dense. Night, heavy with clouds, was coming too, and soon he would be so well hidden that only chance would enable an enemy to find him. In a half hour he stopped and took his bearings as best he could. It seemed to be a wild bit of country. He judged that it was ground cropped too much in early times and left to grow into wilderness again. He was not likely to find anything in it save a hut or two of charcoal burners. It was a lonely region, very desolate now, with the night birds calling. The clouds grew heavier, and he would have been glad of shelter, but he put down the wish, recalling to himself with a sort of fierceness that he was a soldier and must scorn such things. Moreover, it behooved him to make most of his journey in the night, and this forest, which ran almost to Washington, seemed to be provided for his approach. He had fixed the direction of Washington firmly in his mind, having a good idea of location. He kept his horse going at a good walk toward his destination. As his eyes, naturally strong, grew used to the forest, and his horse was sure of foot, they were able to go through the bushes without much trouble. He stopped at intervals to listen for a possible enemy, or friend, but heard nothing except the ordinary sounds of the forest. By and by a wind rose and blew all the clouds away. A shining moon and a multitude of brilliant stars sprang out. Just then Harry came to a hillock, clear of trees, with the ground dipping down beyond. He rode to the highest point of the hillock and looked toward the east into a vast open world lighted by the moon and stars. Off there, just under the horizon, he caught a gleam of white, and he knew instinctively what it was. It was the dome of the capital in that city, which was now the capital of the north alone. It was miles away, but he saw it, and his heart thrilled. He forgot, for the moment, that by his own choice it was no longer his own. Harry sat on his horse and looked a long time at that far white glow, deep down under the horizon. There was the capital of his own country, the real capital. Somehow he could not divest himself of that idea, and he looked until the mists and vapors began to float up from the lowlands, and the white gleam was lost behind them. Then he rode on slowly and thoughtfully, trying to think of a plan that would bring rich rewards for the cause for which he was going to fight. He had discovered something already. He had seen the bayonets of a regiment marching to join the northern army, and he had no doubt that he would see others. Perhaps they would consider themselves strong enough in a day or two to attack. It was for him to learn. He was back in the forest, and now he turned his course more toward the east. By dawn, he would be well in the rear of the northern army, and he must judge then how to act. But all his calculations were upset by a very simple thing, one of nature's commonest occurrences. Rain. The heavy clouds that had gathered early in the night were gone away merely for a time, now they came back in battalions, heavier and more numerous than ever. The shining moon and the brilliant stars were blotted out as if they had never been. A strong wind moaned, and a cold rain came pouring into his face. The blanket that he carried on his saddle, and which he now wrapped around him, could not protect him. The fierce rain drove through it, and he was soaked and shivering. The darkness, too, was so great that he could see only a few yards before him, and he let the horse take his course. Harry thought grimly that he was indeed well hidden in the forest. He was so well hidden that he was lost even to himself. In all that darkness and rain he could not retain the sense of direction, and he had no idea where he was. He rambled about for hours, now and then trying to find shelter behind massive tree trunks, and after every failure, going on in the direction in which he thought Washington lay. His shivering became so strong that he was afraid it would turn into a real chill, and he was resolved to seek a roof if the forest should hold such a thing. It was nearly dawn when he saw dimly the outlines of a cabin standing in a tiny clearing. He believed it to be the hut of a charcoal burner, and he was resolved to take any risk for the sake of its roof. He dismounted and beat heavily upon the door with the butt of a pistol. The answer was so long in coming that he began to believe the hut was empty, which would serve his purpose best of all. But at last a voice, thick with sleep, called, "'Who's there?' "'I'm lost, and I need shelter,' Harry replied. 
Wait a minute, returned the voice. Harry, despite the beat of the rain, heard a shuffling inside, and then through a crack in the door he saw a light spring up. He hoped the owner of the voice would hurry. The rain seemed to be beating harder than ever upon him, and the cold was in his bones. Then the door was thrown back suddenly, and an uncommonly sharp voice shouted, "'Drop the reins! Throw up your hands and walk in where I can see what you are!' Harry found himself looking into the muzzle of an old-fashioned, long-barreled rifle. But the hammer was cocked, and it was held by a pair of large, calloused, and steady hands, belonging to a tall, thin man with powerful shoulders and a bearded face. There was no help for it. The boy dropped the reins, raised his hands over his head, and walked into the hut, where the rain at least did not reach him. It was a rude place of a single room, with a fireplace at one end, a bed in a corner, a small pine table on which a candle burned, and clothing and dried herbs hanging from hooks on the wall. The man wore only a shirt and trousers, and he looked unkempt and wild, but he was a resolute figure. "'Stand over thar, close to the light, where I can see you,' he said. Harry moved over. The muzzle of the rifle followed him. The man could look down the sights of his rifle and at the same time examine his visitor, which he did with thoroughness. "'Now then, Johnny Reb,' he said, "'what are you doing here this time of night and in such weather as this, waking honest citizens out of their beds?' "'Nothing but stand before the muzzle of your rifle.' The man grinned. The answer seemed to appeal to him, and he lowered the weapon, although he did not relax his watchfulness. "'I got the drop on you, Johnny Reb. You're bound to admit that,' he said. "'You didn't catch Seth Perkins napping.' "'I admit it. But why do you call me Johnny Reb?' "'Because that's what you are. You can't tell much about the color of a man's coat after it's been through such a big rain, but I know yourn is gray. I ain't taking no part in this war. They've got to fight it best they can without me.' I'm just an innocent charcoal burner, about the most innocent that ever lived, I guess. But atween you and me, Johnny Reb, my feelings lean the way my state, old Virginia, leans, that is, to the south, which I reckon is lucky for you. Harry saw that the man had blue eyes, and he saw, too, that they were twinkling. He knew with infallible instinct that he was honest and truthful. It's true, he said. I'm a southern soldier, and I'm in your hands. I see that you trust me and I think I can trust you. Just wait till I put that hoss of yourn in the lean-to behind the cabin. He darted out of the door and returned in a minute, shaking the water from his body. That hoss feels better already, he said, and you will too, soon. Now I shut this door, then I kindle up the fire again, and then you take off your clothes and put them and yourself before the blaze. In time you and your clothes will be all dry. The man's manner was all kindness, and the poor little cabin had become a palace. He blew at the coals, threw on dry pine knots, and in a few minutes the flames roared up the chimney. Harry took off his wet clothing, hung it on two cane chairs before the fire, and then proceeded to roast himself. Warmth poured back into his body, and the cold left his bones. Despite his remonstrances, Perkins took a pot out of his cupboard and made coffee. Harry drank two cups of it, and he knew now that the danger of a chill, to be followed by fever, was gone. "'Mr. Perkins,' he said at length, "'you are an angel.' Perkins laughed. "'Maybe I air,' he said. "'But I allow I don't look like one. Guess if I went up and tried to join the real angels, Gabriel would say, "'Go back, Seth Perkins, and improve yourself for four or five thousand years before you try and keep company like ours.' But now, Johnny Reb, since you're feeling a heap better, you might tell me what you was trying to do prowling around in these woods at such time. I meant to go behind the Yankee army, see what reinforcements were coming up, find out their plans if I could, and report to our general. Perkins whistled softly. Say, he said, you look like a boy of sense. What are you wasting your time in little things for? Couldn't you find something bigger and a heap more dangerous that would stir you up and give you action? Harry laughed. I was set to do this task, Mr. Perkins, he said, and I mean to do it. That shows good spirit, but if I was set out to do it, I wouldn't. Do you know whar you are and what's around you, Johnny Reb? No, I don't. Well, you're right inside of the Union lines. The armies of Patterson and McDowell hem in all this forest, and I reckon maybe it was a good thing for you that the storm came up and you got past in it. Was you expecting Johnny Reb to ride right into the Yankee pickets with that Confederate uniform on? 
I don't know exactly what I intended to do. I meant to see in the morning. I didn't know I was so far inside their lines. You know it now, and if you were bound to do what you say you're setting out to do, then you've got to change clothes. Here, I'll take these and hide them. He snatched Harry's uniform from the chair, ran up a ladder into a little room under the eaves, and returned with some rough garments under his arm. These are my Sunday clothes, he said. You're powerful big for your years, and they'll come pretty nigh fitting you. Leastways, they'll fit well enough for such times as these. Now you wear them if you put any value on your life. Harry hesitated. He wished to go as a scout, not as a spy. Clothes could not change a man, but they could change his standing. Yet the words of Perkins were obviously true, but he would not go back. He must do his task. I'll take your clothes on one condition, Mr. Perkins, he said. You must let me pay for them. Will it make you feel better to do so? A great deal better. All right, then. Harry took from his saddlebags the purse which he had removed from his coat pocket when he undressed and handed a ten-dollar gold piece to the charcoal burner. What is it? asked the charcoal burner. A gold eagle, ten dollars. I've heard of them, but it's the first time I ever seed. I'm bound to say I regard that shining coin with a powerful sight of respect. But if I take it, I'm making three dollars. Them clothes of mine just cost seven dollars, and I wore them four times. Count the three dollars in for shelter and gratitude, and remember, you've made your promise. Perkins took the coin, bit it, pitched it up two or three times, catching it as it fell, and then put it upon the hearth, where the blaze could gleam upon it. It's surely a shiner, he said, and being it's the first I've ever had, I reckon I'll take good care of it. Wait a minute. He picked up the coin again, ran up the ladder into the dark eaves of the house, and came back without it. Now, Johnny Reb, he said. Put on my clothes and see how you feel. Harry donned the uncouth garb, which fitted fairly well after he had rolled up the trousers a little. You'd pass for a farmer, said Perkins. I fed your hoss when I put him up, and as soon as the rain's over, you can start again, a sight safer than you was when you wore that uniform. If you come back this way again, I'll give it to you. Now you'd better take a nap. I'll call you when the rain stops. Harry felt that he had indeed fallen into the hands of a friend, and stretching himself on a pallet, which the charcoal burner spread in front of the fire, he soon fell asleep. He awoke when Perkins shook his shoulder and found that it was dawn. The rain stopped, days come, and I guess you'd better be going, said the man. I've got breakfast ready for you, and I hope, boy, that you'll get through with a whole skin. I said that both sides would have to fight this war without my help, but I don't mind giving a boy a hand when he needs it. Harry did not say much, but he was deeply grateful. After breakfast, he mounted his horse, received careful directions from Perkins, and rode toward Washington. The whole forest was fresh and green after its heavy bath, and birds, rejoicing in the morning, sang in every bush. Harry's elation returned. Clothes impart a certain quality, and, dressed in a charcoal burner Sunday best, he began to bear himself like one. He rode in a slouchy manner, and he transferred the pistols from his belt to the large inside pockets of his new coat. As he passed in an hour from the forest into the rolling open country, he saw that Perkins had advised him wisely. Dressed in the Confederate uniform, he would certainly have had trouble before he made the first mile. He saw the camps of troops both to the right and left, and he knew that these were the flank of the Northern Army. Then from the crest of another hill, he caught his second view of Washington. The gleam from the dome of the Capitol was much more vivid now, and he saw other white buildings amid the foliage. Since he had become technically a spy through the mere force of circumstances, Harry took a daring resolve. He would enter Washington itself. They were all one people, Yanks and Johnny Rebs, and no one could possibly know that he was from the Southern Army. Only one question bothered him. He did not know what to do with the horse. End of chapter 24, part 1 of 2. Chapter 24, Part 2 of 2 of The Guns of Bull Run, A Story of the Civil War's Eve. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bill Yallily. The Guns of Bull Run, A Story of the Civil War's Eve, by Joseph A. Altscheller. Chapter 24 but he rode briskly ahead, trusting that the problem of the horse, 
would solve itself, and as he turned into a field, several men in blue uniforms rode forward and ordered him to halt. Harry obeyed promptly. "'Where are you going?' asked the leading man, a minor officer. "'To Washington,' replied the boy in the uncouth language that he thought fitted his role. "'And what are you going to Washington for?' "'To sell this hoss,' replied Harry, on the impulse of the moment. "'I raised him myself, but he's too fine for me to ride, especially when hosses are bringing such good prices.' "'He is a fine animal,' said the officer, looking at him longingly. "'Do you want to sell him now?' Harry shook his head. "'No,' he replied. "'I'm going to make one of them big bugs in Washington pay for him and pay for him good.' The officer laughed. "'You're not such a simpleton as you look,' he said. "'You're right. They'll pay you more for him in the capital than I could. Right on. They may pass you over Longbridge, or they may not. That part of it is not my business.' Harry went forward at a trot, glad enough to leave such dangerous company behind. But he saw that he was now in the very thick of mighty risks. He could encounter a menace at every turn, had he realized fully the character of his undertaking when he was in the charcoal burner's hut, he would have hesitated long. Now there was nothing to do but go ahead and take his fate, whatever it might be. Yet his tale of wishing to sell a horse served him well. After a few questions, it passed him by a half-dozen interruptions, and he became so bold that he stopped and bought food for his noonday meal at a little wayside tavern kept by a woman. Three or four countrymen were lounging about, and all of them were gossips. But Harry found it worth while to listen to their gossip. It was their business to carry vegetables and other provisions into Washington for sale, and they picked up much news. They said that the northern government was pushing all its troops to the front. All the politicians and writers in Washington were clamoring for a battle. One blow and Jeff Davis and his secession would be smashed to atoms. Harry's young blood flamed at the contemptuous words, but he could not afford to show any resentment. Yet this was valuable information. He could confirm Beauregard's belief that an attack would soon be made in great force. When Harry left them, he turned again to the left, as he saw a stretch of country rolling and apparently wooded lying in that direction. Once, when a young boy, he had come to Washington with his father for a stay of several weeks, and he had a fair acquaintance with the region about the capital. He knew that forested hills lay ahead of him, and beyond them, the Potomac. In another hour he was in the hills, which he found without people. Through every opening in the leaves he saw Washington, and he could also discern long lines of redoubts on the Virginia side of the river. Late in the afternoon he came to a small abandoned log cabin. He inferred that its owner had moved away because of the war. As nearly as he could judge it, it had not been occupied for several weeks. Back of it was a small meadow, enclosed with a rail fence, but everything else was deep woods. He turned his horse into the meadow and left his saddle, bridle, and saddle blanket in the house. He might not find anything when he returned, but he must take the risk. Then he set off at a brisk pace through the woods, which opened out a little after dusk, and disclosed a great pillared white house with surrounding outbuildings. He knew at once that this was Arlington, the home of one of the southern generals, Lee, of whom he had heard his father speak well. But he also saw, despite the dusk, blue uniforms and the gleam of bayonets. And as he looked, he saw, too, earthworks and the signs that many men were present. He lay long among the bushes until the night thickened and darkened, and he resolved to inspect the earthworks thoroughly. No very strict watch seemed to be kept, and, in truth, it did not seem to be needed here, so near to Washington and so far away from the southern army. Before ten o'clock everything settled into quiet, and he cautiously climbed a great beech, which was in full and deep foliage. The boughs were so many and the leaves so dense that one standing directly under him could not have seen him. But he went up as far as he could, and, crouched there, made a comprehensive survey. It was a fine moonlight night, and he saw the earthwork stretching for a long distance, thorough and impregnable to anything except a great army. Beyond that was the silver band which was the Potomac, and beyond the river were the clustered roofs which were Washington. But he turned his eyes back to the earthworks, and he tried to fasten firmly in his mind their number and location. This, too, would be important news, most welcome to Beauregard. The boy's elation grew. They gave him a delicate and dangerous task, but he was doing it. He had overcome every obstacle so far, and he would overcome them to the end. He was bound to enter that Washington, which in the distance seemed to lie in such a close cluster. 
he felt that he had lingered long enough at Arlington, and descending he made a great curve around the earthworks, coming to the river north of Arlington. His next problem was the passage of the Potomac. He did not dare to try Long Bridge, which he knew would be guarded strictly, but he thought he might find some boatman who would take him over. As the capital was so crowded, the farmers were continually crossing with loads of provisions, and now that an uncommonly hot July had come, the night would be a favorite time for the passage. A search up and down the bank brought its reward. A Virginian, who said his name was Grimes, had a heavy boat filled with vegetables, and Harry was welcome as a helper. "'It's a dollar for you,' said Grimes, who did not trouble to ask the boy his name. "'And here are your oars.' The two, pulling strongly, shot the boat out into the stream, and then rowed in a diagonal line for the city, which rose up brilliant and great in the moonlight. Other boats were in the river, but they paid no attention to the barge, loaded with produce, and rowed by two innocent countrymen. They soon reached the Washington shore, and Grimes handed Harry a silver dollar. "'You're a strong young fellow," he said, "'and I guess you've earned the money. My farm is only four miles up the river, and there's going to be a big market for all I can raise. I need a good hand to help me work it. How'd you like to come with me and take a good job, while them that don't know no better go ahead and do the fighting?" "'Thank you for your offer,' replied Harry. "'But what I've got business to attend to in Washington.' He slipped the dollar into his pocket, because he had earned it honestly, and entered Washington, just as the rising sun began to gild domes and roofs. Coming from the boat, his appearance aroused no suspicion. People were pouring into Washington then, as they were pouring into the Confederate capital at Richmond. One dressed as he, looking as he, could enter or depart almost as he pleased, despite the ring of fortifications. Up went the sun, and the full day came, extremely hot and clear. Harry turned into a little restaurant and spent half of his well-earned dollar for breakfast. Neither proprietor nor waiter gave him more than a casual glance. Evidently they were used to serving countrymen. Harry, feeling refreshed and strong again, paid for his food and went outside. The streets were thronged. He had expected nothing else, but there was a great air of excitement and expectancy as if something important were going to happen. "'What is it?' asked Harry of a man beside him. "'Don't you know what day this is?' asked the man. "'I forgot,' replied the boy in the slouchy speech and intonation of the hills. "'I just came in with Dad this morning, bringing a wagon load of fresh vegetables.' "'You look as foolish as you talk,' said the man scornfully. "'This is the Fourth of July, and the special session of Congress called by President Lincoln is to meet this morning and decide how to give the rebels the thrashing they need.' "'I did hear something about that,' replied Harry. "'But working in the field, I forgot all about it. I allow I'll stroll that way.' He drifted on with the crowd toward the Capitol, which rose nobler and more imposing than ever, a great marble building, gleaming white in the sunshine. Harry's heart throbbed. He could not yet disassociate himself from the idea that he, as one of the nation, was a part owner of the capital. But forgetting all danger, he persisted in his errand. A great event was about to occur, and he intended to see it. There were soldiers everywhere. The street blazed with uniforms, but the people were allowed to gather about the capital, and many also entered. A friendly sentinel passed Harry, who stood for a few minutes in the rotunda. He was careful to keep near the other spectators, in order that he might not attract attention to himself. All things that he saw cut sharply into his sensitive and eager mind. It was in truth an extraordinary situation for one who had come as he had come, and waited, calm of face, but with every pulse beating. The comments of the other spectators told him who the famous men were as they entered. Here were Cameron and Wade of the lowering brows. There passed Taney, the venerable Chief Justice, and then drying quiet Hamlin. The Vice President, on his way to preside over the Senate, went by. A tall, magnificent figure in a general's uniform next attracted Harry's attention. He was an old man, but he held himself very erect, and his head was crowned with splendid snowy hair. "'Old fuss and feathers,' said a man near Harry, and the boy knew that this was General Scott, the Virginian who had led the famous and victorious march into the city of Mexico, and who was now, in name, but in name only, commander of the Northern Army. His father had served under him in those memorable battles, and Harry looked at him with a certain veneration, as the old man passed on and disappeared into another room. Then came more, some famous, others destined to be so. The atmosphere of the great building was surcharged. Harry and his comrades had heard that the North was discouraged, that the people would not fight, that they would let the erring sisters go in peace. It did not seem so to him here. The talk was all of war and of invading the South, and he seemed to feel a tenacious spirit behind it. 
He managed to secure entrance to the lobbies of both Senate and House, and he listened for a while to the debates. He discovered the same spirit there. He felt that he had a right to report not only on the forts of Washington and the movements of brigades, but also on the temper in the North. Resolution and tenacity, he now saw, were worth as much as cannonballs. Harry did not leave the Capitol until the middle of the afternoon, when he drifted back to the restaurant at which he had obtained his breakfast, where he spent the other half of the dollar for luncheon. Then he resolved to escape from Washington that night. He had picked up by casual talk and observation together a fair knowledge of Washington's defenses. Above all, he had learned that the North was pouring troops in an unbroken stream into the capital, and that the great advance on the line of Bull Run would take place very soon. He could scarcely expect to achieve more. He had already surpassed his hopes, and it was surely time to go. He left the restaurant. The streets were still crowded, and he saw standing at the nearest corner a figure that seemed familiar. He took a long look and then he was shaken with alarm. It was Shepard. He had seen him under such tense conditions that he could never forget the man. The turn of his shoulders, the movement of his head, all were familiar. And Harry had a great respect for the keenness and intelligence of Shepard. He could not forget how Shepard had talked to him that night in Montgomery. There was something uncanny about the man, and he had a sudden conviction that Shepard had seen him long since and was watching him. He thrust his hands into his capacious pockets, the pistols were still there, and he resolved that he would use them if need be. He went at first toward the Potomac, and he did not look back for a long time, rambling about the streets in a manner apparently aimless. Now and then a quiver ran down his back, and he knew it was due to the mental fear that Shepard was pursuing. When he did look back at last, he did not see him, and he felt immediate elation. It would not be long now until dark, and then he would make his escape across the river. Time was slow, but it could not keep darkness back forever and, as soon as it had come fully, he turned toward the north. Southern troops would not be looked for there, and egress would be easier in that direction. He passed on without interruption, and soon was in the suburbs, which were then so shabby. Then he looked back, and cold fear plucked at the roots of his hair. A man was following him, and he could tell even in the dim light that it was Shepard. A shudder shook him now. A rope was the fate for a spy but he recovered himself and walked on faster than ever. The cabins thinned away, and he saw before him bushes. His keen hearing brought to him the soft sounds of the pursuing footsteps. Now he took his resolution. There were few games at which two could not play. He passed between two bushes, came around, and returned to the open. But he returned with one of the pistols cocked and leveled, his finger on the trigger. Shepard, pursuing swiftly, walked almost against the muzzle, and Harry laughed softly. Well, Mr. Shepard, he said, you followed me well, but as I've no mind to be hung for a spy or anything else, I must ask you to go back. You have the advantage at present, it is true, said Shepard, but what makes you think I was going to shoot at you or have you seized? Isn't it what one would naturally expect? Yes, perhaps, but I could have given the alarm while you were still in the city, and I speak the truth when I say I do not know just what I had in mind, but at all events the tables are turned. You hold me at the pistol's muzzle, and I admit it. He smiled, and the boy could not keep from liking him. Mr. Shepard, said Harry, what you told me at Montgomery was true. We of the South did not realize the numbers, power, and spirit of the North. I know now the truth of what you told me, but on the other hand, you of the North do not realize the fire, courage, and devotion of the South. I understand it, but I'm afraid that not many of our people do so. Suppose we call it quits once more. Let this be Montgomery all over again. You do not want to shoot me here any more than I wanted to shoot you down there. I admit that also, said Harry. Then you are safe from me, if I am safe from you. Agreed, said Harry, as he lowered the weapon. Goodbye, said Shepard. Goodbye. But they did not offer to shake hands. Each turned his back on the other, and when Harry stopped in the bushes, he saw only the dim outlines of Washington. At midnight he found a colored man who, for pay, rode him across the Potomac. At dawn he found his horse peacefully grazing in the meadow, and at the next dawn he was once more within southern lines. End of chapter 24, part 2 of 2. Recording by Bill Yaddily. Chapter 15 
of The Guns of Bull Run, A Story of the Civil War's Eve. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michael Packard of Western Colorado. The Guns of Bull Run, A Story of the Civil War's Eve, by Joseph A. Altscheller. Chapter 15. Battle's Eve. Harry found little change in the Southern Army, except that more troops had come up from Richmond. It still rested upon Bull Run. The country here was old, having been cropped for many generations, the soil mostly clay and cut in deep ruts. There were many ravines and watercourses, and hillocks were numerous. Colonel Talbot had told Harry a month before that it was not a bad place for a battleground, and he remembered it now as he came back to it. He had not taken the time to return to the charcoal burner's hut for his uniform, and when he approached his own lines, he still wore the Sunday best of Perkins. The sentinel who hailed him first doubted his claim that he was a member of the Invincibles, but he insisted so urgently and called all of its officers by name so readily that he was passed on. He dismounted, gave his horse to an orderly, and walked toward a clump of trees where he saw Colonel Talbot riding on a small table in the open. The colonel, engrossed in his work, did not look up, as the boy's footsteps made little sound on the turf. When Harry stood before him, he saluted and said, I have returned to make my report, Colonel Talbot. The colonel looked up, uttered a cry of pleasure, and seized Harry by both hands. Thank God you've come back, my boy, he said. I hesitated to send your father's son on such an errand, but I thought that you would succeed. You have seen the enemy's forces? I've been in Washington itself, said Harry, some pride showing in his voice. Then we'll go over at once to General Beauregard. He is in his tent now, conferring with some of his chief officers. A great marquis stood in the shade of a grove, only two or three hundred yards away. Its sides were open, as the heat was great, and Harry saw the commander-in-chief within, talking earnestly with men in the uniform of generals. Longstreet, Early, Hill, and others were there. Harry was somewhat abashed, but he had the moral support of Colonel Talbot, and, after the first few moments of embarrassment, he told his story in a direct and incisive manner. The officers listened with attention. It confirms the other reports, said Beauregard. It goes further, said Longstreet. Our young friend here has obviously a lad of intelligence and discernment, and what he saw in Washington shows that the North is resolved to crush us. The battle that we are going to fight will not be the last battle by any means. Each side is too sanguine, said Hill. You have done well, Lieutenant Kenton, said Beauregard, and now you can rejoin your regiment. You will receive a promotion of one grade. Harry was glad to leave the Marquis and hurry toward the camp of the Invincibles. The first of his friends whom he saw was Happy Tom Langdon, bathing his face in a little stream that flowed into Young's branch. He walked up and smote him joyously on the back. Langdon sprang to his feet in anger and exclaimed, Hey, you fellow, what do you mean by that? He saw before him the tall, gawky youth in ill-fitting clothes, his face a mask of dust. But this same dusty youth grinned and replied, I hit you once. And if you don't speak to me more politely, I'll hit you twice. Langdon stared. Then recognition came. Harry Kenton, by all that is wonderful, he exclaimed. And so you've come back. I was afraid you never would. What have you been doing, Harry? I've been pretty busy. I drove up the right wing of the Yankee army, put to flight a couple of brigades in their center, and then went on to Washington and had a talk with Lincoln. I told him the North would have me to reckon with if he kept on with this war, but he said he'd believed he'd go ahead anyhow. I even mentioned your name to him, but the menace did no good. Langdon called St. Clair, and soon Harry was surrounded by friends who gave him the warmest of greetings, and who insisted upon the tale of his adventures, a part of which he was free to tell. Then a new uniform was brought to him, and after a long and refreshing bath in a deep pool of the stream, he put it on. He felt now as if he had been entirely made over, and as he strolled back to camp, a tall, thin man, black of hair and pallid of face, hailed him. Harry took two glances before he recognized Arthur Travers in the southern uniform. 
Then he grasped his hand eagerly and asked him when he had come. Two days ago, replied Travers. I'm in another regiment farther along Bull Run. I merely came over to tell you that your father was well when I last heard from him. He was with the Western forces that are about to be under Albert Sidney Johnson. Harry did not care greatly for Travers, but it was pleasant to see anybody from his old home, and they talked some time. But Harry did not see him again soon, as the bonds of discipline were now tightened. Regiments were kept in ranks, and the men were not permitted to wander from their places. Northern bands were continually on their front, and it was reported daily that the great army at Washington was about to move. Yet the days passed, and no important event occurred. July advanced. The heat became more intense. The fields were bare, the vegetation trodden out by armies, and when the wind rose, clouds of dust beat upon them. It was lucky for them that the country was cut by so many streams. The Invincibles were moved about several times, but they stopped at last at a little plateau where a branch of railroad joined the main stem, giving to the place the name Manassas Junction. Bull Run was near, flowing between high banks, but with crossings at fords and two bridges. Beauregard had thrown up earthworks at the station, and strong batteries were hidden in the foliage at the fords. The southern army, weary of waiting, was eager for battle. The northern army, also weary of waiting, demanded that their own troops advance. As Harry sat with his friends one hot night, the word was passed that the northern army was coming at last. The southern scouts had reported that McDowell's whole force was already on the march and drawing near. It would attempt the passage of Bull Run. A murmur ran through the camp of the Invincibles, but there was little talk. They had already tasted battle at the ford in the valley, and it was not a thing to be taken lightly. Harry resolved that he would sleep if he could, but there was no rest for the Invincibles just then. An order came from Beauregard, and, with Colonel Talbot at their head, they took up their arms, marching to one of the fords of Bull Run, where they lay down among the trees near a battery. They were forbidden to talk, but they whispered nevertheless. The ford before them was Blackburn's and the heavy attack of the northern army would be made there in the morning. Harry and the Invincibles were at the very edge of the river. They had been under heavy fire before, but nevertheless everything they now saw or heard played upon their nerves. The murmur of the little river was multiplied thrice. Every time a bayonet or saber rattled, it smote with sharpness upon the ear. The neigh of a horse became a lingering note and out of the darkness that covered the rolling country in front of them came many sounds, but few of which were real. For a long time there was movement on their own side of the stream. Troops were continually coming up in the night and taking position. It required no acute mind to perceive that the southern commander expected the main attack to be made here, and was massing his troops in force to receive it. Except at the ford itself, the banks of the river were high, but those on the northern side were higher. A skirt of forest lined the southern bank, and Harry saw Longstreet and his men march into it, and lie there on their arms. Nearer to him among the trees were the powerful batteries of artillery. Beauregard himself had come, and he now had with him seven brigades eager for the attack. The light was hot and windless, save at distant intervals, when a light breeze blew from the north. Then it brought dust with it, and Harry believed that it came from the dry soil, trod to powder by the marching feet of a great army and the wheels of many cannon. Comparative silence came after a while on his own side of the river. There was no sharp sound, only a low and almost continuous murmur made by the whispering and restless movements which so many thousands of men could not avoid. But the sound was so steady that they heard above it the croak of the frogs at the edge of the stream and then another sound, which Harry at first did not understand. What is it? he whispered to St. Clair, who lay a little higher than he. It's a lot of our men crossing the ford. Raise up and you can see them walking in the water. I take it that the general is going to put a force in the bushes and trees on the other bank to sting the northern army good and hard before it pushes home the main attack. Standing up, Harry saw men wading bull run in a long file, everyone carrying a rifle on his shoulder. 
In the hot dim night they looked like a line of Indians advancing through the water to choose an ambush. They were crossing for half an hour, and then they melted away. He could not see one of the figures again, nor did any sound come from them, but he knew that the riflemen lay there in the bushes, and that many a men would fall before they waited Bull Run again. Do you think the attack is really coming this time? whispered Langdon. I feel sure of it, whispered Harry, and all the scouts have said so, and you may laugh at me, Tom, but I tell you that when the wind blows our way, I feel the dust raised by thirty thousand men marching towards us. I'm not laughing at you, Harry. Sometimes that instinct of yours tells when things are coming long before you can see or hear them. But while I'm not such a wonder myself, I can hear those bullfrogs croaking down there at the edge of the water. Think of their cheek, calmly singing their night songs between two armies of twenty or thirty thousand men each, who are going to fight tomorrow. But it's not their fight, said Sinclair, and maybe they are croaking for a lot of us. Shut up, you bird of ill omen, you raven, you, said Happy Tom. Everything is going to happen for the best. We are going to win the victory, and we are going to come out of the battle all right. St. Clair did not answer him. His was a serious nature, and he foresaw a great struggle which would waver long in doubt. Harry had lain down on his blanket and was seeking sleep again. Stop talking, he said to the other two. We've got to go to sleep if it's only for the sake of our nerves. We must be fresh and steady when we go up into battle in the morning. I suppose you're right, said Happy Tom but I find this overtaking slumber a long chase. Maybe you can form a habit of sleeping well before big battles, but I haven't had the chance to do so yet. Harry did fall asleep after a while, but he awoke before dawn to find that there was already a bustle of movement in the army about him. Fires were lighted further back, and an early but plentiful breakfast was cooked. All were up and ready when the sun rose over the Virginia fields. Another hot day, said Happy Tom. See, the sun is as red as fire, and look how it burns on the water there. Yes, hot it will be, Harry said to himself. They had eaten their breakfast and lay once more among the trees. Harry searched with his eyes the bushes and thickets on the other side for their riflemen, but most of them were still invisible in the day. Then the southern brigades were ordered to lie down, but after they lay there some time, Harry felt that the film of dust on the edge of the wind was growing stronger, and presently they saw a great cloud of it rising above hills and trees and moving toward them. They're coming, said St. Clair. In less than half an hour they'll be at the ford. But I doubt they know what is waiting for them, said Harry. The cloud of dust rapidly came nearer, and now they heard the beat of horses' feet and the clank of artillery. Harry began to breathe hard, and he and the other young officers walked up and down the lines of their company. All the Invincibles clearly saw that great plume of dust, and heard the ominous sounds that came with it. It was very near now, but suddenly the fringe of the forest on the far side of the river burst into flame. The hidden riflemen had opened fire and were burning the front of the advancing army, but the northern men came steadily on, rousing the riflemen out of the bushes, and then they appeared among the trees on the north side of Bull Run a New York brigade led by Tyler. The moment their faces showed, there was a tremendous discharge from the southern batteries masked in the wood. The crash was appalling, and Harry shut his eyes for a moment in horror as he saw the entire front rank of the northern force go down. Then the southern sharpshooters in hundreds who lined the water's edge opened with the rifle, and a storm of lead crashed into the ranks of the hapless New Yorkers. Up, Invincibles! cried Colonel Talbot, and they began to fire and load and fire again into the attacking force, which had walked into what was almost an ambush. They'll never reach the ford, shouted Happy Tom. Never, Harry shouted back. The southern generals, already trained in battles, pushed their advantages. A great force of southern sharpshooters crossed the river and took the northern brigade in flank. The New Yorkers, unable to stand the tremendous artillery and rifle fire in their front, and the new rifle fire on their side also broke and retreated. But another brigade came up to their relief, and they advanced again, sending a heavy return fire from their rifles, while the artillery on their flank replied to that of the south. The combat now became fierce. The Invincibles, in the thick of it, advanced to the water's edge and fired as fast as they could load and reload. Huge volumes of smoke gathered over both sides of Bull Run, and men fell fast. 
There was also a rain of twigs and boughs as the bullets and shells cut through them, and the dense, heated air shot through with smoke burned the throats of blue and gray. But the South had the advantage of position and numbers. Moreover, those riflemen on the flanks of the northern troops burned them terribly, and they were wary, too, with long marching in dust and heat. As the artillery and rifle fire converged upon them and became heavier and heavier, they were forced to give way. They yielded ground slowly until they were beyond range of the cannon, and then, brushing off the fierce swarm of sharpshooters on their flank, they retreated all the way back to the village whence they had come. The firing on the southern side of Bull Run ceased suddenly, and the smoke began to drift away. The Invincibles, save those who had fallen to stay, stood up and shouted. They had won the greatest victory in the world, and they flung taunts in the direction of the retreating foe. Stop that, shouted Colonel Talbot, striding up and down the line. This is only a beginning. Wait until we have a real battle. This has happened for the best, said Happy Tom, but I'd like to know what the Colonel calls a real battle. The fire was so loud I couldn't hear myself speak, and I know at least a million men were engaged. Arthur, how could you be cool enough to bathe your face in that water? It's to make it cool, replied St. Clair, who had stooped over Bull Run and was laving his face. I feel that dust and burnt gunpowder are thick all over me. He stood up, his face now clean, and began to arrange his uniform. Then he carefully dusted his coat and trousers. Hope you're all ready for another battle, Arthur, said Tom. <laughs> Not yet, replied St. Clair, laughing. That'll do me for quite a while. St. Clair had his wish. The enemy seemed to have enough for the time. The hot, breathless day passed without any further advance. Now and then they heard the northern bugles, and the scouts reported that the foe was still gathering heavily not far away, but the Invincibles from their camp saw nothing. I suppose the colonel was right, said Happy Tom, and this must have been some sort of prologue. But if the prologue was so hot, what's the play going to be? Something hotter, said Harry. A vague but true answer, said Langdon. Yet the delay was long. They lay all day and all night along the banks of Bull Run, and a hundred conflicting reports ran up and down their ranks. The northern army would retreat. It would attack within a few hours. The southern army would retreat. It would hold its present position. Both sides would receive reinforcements. Neither would receive any fresh troops. Every statement was immediately denied. I refuse to believe anything until it happens, said Harry when night came. I'm getting hardened to all this sort of thing, and as soon as my time off duty comes, I'm going to sleep. Sleep he did in the shot-torn woods, and it was the heavy sleep of exhaustion. Nerves did not trouble him as he slept without dreams and rose to another windless burning day. The hours dragged on again. But in the night there was a tremendous shouting. Johnston, with 8,000 men, had slipped away from Patterson in the mountains, and the infantry had come by train directly to the plateau of Manassas, where they were now leaving the cars and taking their place in the line of battle. The artillery and cavalry were coming on behind over the dirt road. The southern generals were already showing the energy and decision for which they were so remarkable in the first years of the war. Johnston was the senior but since Beauregard had made the battlefield, he left him in command. The Invincibles were moved off to the left along Bull Run, and were posted in front of a stone bridge, where the troops gathered until twelve or thirteen thousand men were there. But Harry and his comrades were nearest to the bridge, and it seemed to him that the situation was almost exactly as it had been three nights before. Again they faced Bull Run, and again they expected an attack in the morning. There was no change save the difference between a ford and a bridge. But the Invincibles, hardened by the three days of skirmishing and waiting, took things more easily now. They lay in the woods near the steep banks, and the batteries commanded the entrance to the bridge. The night was once more hot and windless, and they lay there so quietly that they could hear the murmur of the waters. Far across Bull Run they saw dim lights moving, and they knew that they were those of the northern army. I think things have changed a lot in the last three days, said Harry. Then the Yankees didn't know much about us. They charged almost blindfolded into our ambush. Now we don't know much about them. We don't know by any means where the attack is coming. It is they who are keeping us guessing. But there are only two fords and two bridges across Bull Run, said Langdon, and they've got to choose one out of the lot, which means we've got to accumulate our forces at one of the four places. Guess one out of four. 
Harry did not speak at all in a tone of discouragement, but his intelligent mind saw that the northern leaders had profited by their mistakes, and that the southern general did not really know where the great impact would come. The northern scouts and skirmishers swarmed on the other side of Bull Run. Even in the darkness, this cloud of wasps was so dense that Beauregard's own scouts could not get beyond them to tell what the greater mass behind was doing. Harry was summoned at midnight by Colonel Talbot. Behind a clump of trees some distance back of the bridge, Beauregard, Johnston, Evans, who was in direct command at the ford, Early, and several other important officers were in anxious consultation. Colonel Talbot told Harry that he would be wanted presently as a messenger, and he stood on one side while the others talked. It was then that he first heard Jubal Early swear with a richness, a spontaneity, and an unction that raised it almost to the dignity of a right. Harry gathered that they could not agree as to the point at which the northern attack would be delivered, but the balance of opinion inclined to the bridge, before which the command of Evans was encamped. Hence, he was sent farther down the stream with a message for a North Carolina regiment to move up and join Evans. The regiment lay about a mile away, but Harry walked almost the entire distance among sleeping men. They lay in the grass by thousands, and exhausted by the movement and marching of recent days, they slept heavily. In the moonlight, they looked as if they were dead. It was so quiet now that some night birds in the trees uttered strange moaning cries. But far across Bull Run, light still moved, and Harry had no doubt that the great battle, delayed so long, was really coming in the morning. The North Carolina regiment rose sleepily and marched with him to the bridge, where it was incorporated into the force of Evans. Beauregard, Johnston, and Early had gone to other points, and Harry knew that they were still anxious and of divided opinions. Colonel Talbot and Lieutenant Colonel St. Hilaire, to whom he had to report, and who moved their regiment down near Evans, did not conceal the fact from him. Harry, said the colonel, we are all sure that we'll have to fight on the morrow, and it looks as if the battle would come in the greatest weight here at the bridge, but the Invincibles must be prepared for anything. You lads are fit and trim, and I hope that all of you will do your duty tomorrow. Remember that we have brave foes before us, and I know most of their officers, all who are of our age, and have been comrades of Lieutenant Colonel St. Hilaire and myself. It's true, and it is a melancholy phase of this war, said Hector St. Hilaire. They walked away together, and Harry rejoined those of his own age near the banks of Bull Run. But Langdon and St. Clair were sound asleep on their blankets and so were all the rest of the Invincibles, save those who had been posted as sentinels. But Harry did not sleep that night. It was past midnight now, and he was never more awake in his life, and he felt that he must watch until day. He had no duties to do, and he sat down with his back to a tree and waited. Far in his front, three or four miles perhaps, he saw the lights signaling to each other, but he had no idea what they meant, and he watched them merely with an idle curiosity. Once he thought he heard the distant call of a trumpet, but he was not sure. Woods and fields were flooded with the brightness of moon and stars, but if anything was passing on the other side of Bull Run, it was too well hidden for him to see. His senses were soothed, and he sank into a state of peace and rest. In reality, it was a physical relaxation coming on after so much tension and activity, and the bodily ease became mental also. Resting thus, Motionless against the trunk of a tree, time passed easily for him. The warm air of the night blew now and then against his face, and only soothed him to deeper rest. The last light far across Bull Run went out, and the darker hours came. Nothing stirred now in the woods until the hot dawn came again, and the brazen sun leaped up in the sky. End of chapter 15 Recording by Michael Packard of Western Colorado Chapter 16 of The Guns of Bull Run, A Story of the Civil War's Eve. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michael Packard of Western Colorado. The Guns of Bull Run, A Story of the Civil War's Eve, by Joseph A. Altscheller. Chapter 16 
Bull Run. Harry rose to his feet and shook St. Clair and Langdon. Up, boys, he said. The enemy will soon be here. I can see their bayonets glittering on the hills. The Invincibles sprang to their feet almost as one man, and soon all the troops of Evans were up and humming like bees. Food and coffee were served to them hastily, but before the last cup was thrown down, a heavy crash came from one of the hills beyond Bull Run, and a shell, screaming over their heads, burst beyond them. It was quickly followed by another, and then the round shot and shells came in dozens from batteries which had been posted well in the night. The southern batteries replied with all their might, and the riflemen supported them, sending the bullets in sheets across Bull Run. The battle flamed in fifteen minutes into extraordinary violence. Harry had never before heard such a continuous and terrific thunder. It seemed that the drums of his ears would be smashed in, but over his head he heard the continuous hissing and whirring of steel and lead. The northern riflemen were at work too, and it was fortunate for the Invincibles that they were able to lie down as they poured their fire into the bushes and woods on the opposite bank. The volume and smoke was so great that they could no longer see the position of the enemy, but Harry believed that so much metal must do great damage. Although he was a lieutenant, he had snatched up a rifle dropped by some fallen soldier, and he loaded and fired it so often that the barrel grew hot in his hand. Lying so near the river, most of the hostile fire went over the heads of the Invincibles, but now and then a shell or a cluster of bullets struck among them, and Harry heard groans. But he quickly forgot these sounds as he watched the clouds of smoke and the blaze of fire from the other side of Bull Run. They're not trying to force the passage of the bridge. Everything is for the best, shouted Langdon. No, they dare not shouted St. Clair in reply. No column could live on that bridge in face of our fire. It seemed strange to Harry that the northern troops made no attempt to cross. Why did all this tremendous fire go on so long and yet not a foe set foot upon the bridge? It seemed to him that it had endured for hours. The sun was rising higher and higher and the day was growing hotter and hotter. It lay with the north to make the first movement to cross Bull Run, and yet no attempt was made. Colonel Talbot came repeatedly along the side of the Invincibles, and Harry saw that he was growing uneasy. Such a great volume of fire, without any effort to take advantage of it, made the veteran suspicious. He knew that those old comrades of his on the other side of Bull Run would not waste their metal in a mere cannonade and long-range rifle fire. There must be something behind it. Presently, with the consent of the commander, he drew the Invincibles back from the river, where they were permitted to cease firing and rest for a while on their arms. But as they drew long breaths and tried to clear the smoke from their throats, a rumor ran down the lines. The attack at the bridge was but a feint. Only a minor portion of the hostile army was there. The greater mass had gone on and had already crossed the river in face of the weak left flank of the southern army. Beauregard had been outwitted. The Yankees were now in great force on his own side of Bull Run, and it would be a pitched battle face to face. The whole line of the Invincibles quivered with excitement, and then Harry saw that the rumor was true, or that their commander at least believed it to be so. The firing stopped entirely, and the bugles blew in retreat. All the brigades gathered themselves up, and, wild with anger and chagrin, slowly withdrew. Why are they retreating? exclaimed Langdon angrily. Not a Yankee has set foot on the bridge. We're not whipped. No, said Harry. We're not whipped, but if we don't retreat, we will be. If fifteen or twenty thousand Yankees struck us on the flank while those fellows are still in front, everything would go. These were young troops, who considered a retreat equivalent to a beating, and fierce murmurs ran along the line but the officers paid no attention, marching them steadily on, while the artillery rumbled by their side. Both to right and left they heard the sound of firing, and they saw the smoke floating against both horizons, but they paid little attention to it. They were wondering what was in store for them. "'Cheer up, you lads,' cried Colonel Talbot. "'You'll get all the fighting you can stand, and it won't be long in coming either.' They marched only half an hour, and then the troops were drawn up on a hill, 
where the officers rapidly formed them into position. It was none too soon. A long blue line, bristling with cannon on either flank, appeared across the field. It was Burnside, with the bulk of the northern army, moving down upon them. Harry was standing beside Colonel Talbot, ready to carry his orders, and he heard the veteran say between his teeth, The Yankees have fooled us, and this is the great battle at last. The two forces looked at each other for a few moments. Elsewhere, great guns and rifles were already at work, but the sounds came distantly. On the hill and in the fields there was silence, save for the steady tramp of the advancing northern troops. Then from the rear of the marching lines suddenly came a burst of martial music. The northern bands, by a queer inversion, were playing Dixie. In Dixie land I'll take my stand to live and die for Dixie. Look away, look away, down south in Dixie. Harry's feet beat to the tune. The wild and thrilling air played for the first time to troops going into battle. We must answer that, he said to St. Clair. Here comes the answer, said St. Clair. And the southern bands began to play The Girl I Left Behind Me. The music entered Harry's veins. He could not look without a quiver upon the great mass of men bearing down upon them, but the strains of fife and drum put courage in him and told him to stand fast. He saw the face of Colonel Talbot grow darker and darker, and he had enough experience himself to know that the odds were heavily against them. The intense burning sun poured down a flood of light lighting up the opposite ranks of blue and gray and gleaming along swords and bayonets. Nearer and nearer came the piercing notes of Dixie. They march well, murmured Colonel Talbot, and they will fight well too. He did not know that McDowell himself, the northern commander, was now before them, driving on his men, but he did know that the courage and skill of his old comrades were for the present in the ascendant. Burnside was at the head of the division, and it seemed long enough to wrap the whole southern command in its folds and crush it. Scattered rifle shots were heard on either flank, and the young invincibles began to breathe heavily. Millions of black specks danced before them in the hot sunshine, and their nervous ears magnified every sound tenfold. I wish that tune the Yankees were playing was ours, said Tom Langdon. I think I could fight battles by it. Then we'll have to capture it, said Harry. Now the time for talking ceased. The rifle fire on the flanks was rising to a steady rattle, and then came the heavy boom of the cannon on either side. Once more the air was filled with the shriek of shells and the whistling of rifle bullets. Men were falling fast, and through the rising clouds of smoke Harry saw the blue line still coming on. It seemed to him that they would be overwhelmed, trampled underfoot, routed, but he heard Colonel Talbot shouting, Steady, Invincibles, steady! And Lieutenant Colonel St. Hilaire, walking up and down the lines, also uttered the same shout. But the blue lines never ceased coming. Harry could see the faces dark with sweat and dust and powder still pressing on. It was well for the Southerners that nearly all of them had been trained in the use of the rifle, and it was well for them, too, that most of the officers were men of skill and experience. Recruits, they stood fast nevertheless and the rifle sent the bullets in an unceasing, bitter hail straight into the advancing ranks of blue. There was no sound from the bands now. If they were playing somewhere in the rear, no one heard. The fire from the cannon and rifles was a steady roll, louder than thunder and more awful. The northern troops hesitated at last, in face of such a resolute stand and such acute firing. Then they retreated a little, and a shout of triumph came from the southern lines, but the respite was only for a moment. The men in blue came on again, walking over their dead and past their wounded. If they keep pressing in, and it looks as if they would, they will crush us, murmured Colonel Talbot, but he did not let the Invincibles hear him say it. He encouraged them with voice and example, and they bent forward somewhat to meet the second charge of the northern army which was now coming. The smoke lifted a little, and Harry saw the green fields and the white house of the widow Henry standing almost in the middle of the battlefield, but unharmed. Then his eyes came back to the hostile line, which, torn by shot and shell, had closed up nevertheless, and was advancing again in overwhelming force. 
Harry now had a sudden horrible fear that they would be trodden under foot. He looked at St. Clair and saw his face was ghastly. Langdon had long since ceased to smile or utter words of happy philosophy. Open up and let the guns through, someone suddenly cried, and a wild cheer of relief burst from the Invincibles as they made a path. The valiant B and Bartow, rushing to the sound of the great firing, had come with nearly three thousand men and a whole battery. Never were men more welcome. They formed instantly along the southern front, and the battery opened at once with all its guns, while the three thousand men sent a new fire into the northern ranks. Yet the northern charge still came. McDowell, Burnside, and the others were pressing at home, seeking to drive the southern army from its hill, while they were yet able to bring forces largely superior to bear upon it. The thunder and crash of the terrible conflict rolled over all the hills and fields for miles. It told the other forces of either army that here was the center of the battle, and here was its crisis. The sounds reached an extraordinary young old man, bearded and awkward, often laughed at, but never to be laughed at again. One of the most wonderful soldiers the world has ever produced, and instantly gathering up his troops, he rushed them towards the very heart of the combat. Stonewall Jackson was about to receive his famous nickname. Jackson's burning eyes swept proudly over the ranks of his tall Virginians, who mourned every second they lost from the battle. An officer, retreating with his battery, glanced at him, opened his mouth to speak, but closed it again without saying a word, and, infused with new hope, turned his guns afresh toward the enemy. Already men were fleeing the magnetic current of energy and resolution that flowed from Jackson like water from a fountain. A message from Colonel Talbot, which he was to deliver to Jackson himself, sent Harry to the rear. He rode a borrowed horse, and he galloped rapidly until he saw a long line of men marching forward at a swift but steady pace. At their head rode a man on a sorrel horse. His shoulders were stooped a little, and he leaned forward in the saddle, gazing intently at the vast bank of smoke and flame before him. Harry noticed that his hands upon the bridle reins did not twitch, nor did the horseman seem at all excited. Only his burning eyes showed that every faculty was concentrated upon the task. Harry was conscious even then that he was in the presence of General Jackson. The boy delivered his message. Jackson received it without comment never taking his eyes from the battle, which was now raging so fiercely in front of them. Behind came his great brigade of Virginians, the smoke and flame of the battle entering their blood and making their hearts pound fast as they moved forward with increasing speed. Harry rode back with the young officers of his staff, and now they saw men dash out of the smoke and run towards them. They cried that everything was lost, the lip of Jackson curled in contempt. The long line of his Virginians stopped the fugitives and drove them back to the battle. It was evident to Harry, young that he was, that Jackson would be just in time. Then they saw a battery galloping from that bank of smoke and flame, and, its officer swearing violently, exclaimed that he had been left without support. The stern face and somber eyes of Jackson were turned upon him. "'Unlimber your guns at once,' he said. "'Here is your support.' Then the valiant B himself came, covered with dust, his clothes torn by bullets, his horse in a white lather. He, too, turned to that stern brown figure, unflinching as death itself, and he cried that the enemy in overwhelming numbers were beating them back. Then, said Jackson, we'll close up and give them the bayonet. His teeth shut down like a vice. Again, the electric current leapt forth and sparkled through the veins of B, who turned and rode back into the southern throng, the Virginians following swiftly. Then Jackson looked over the field with the eye and mind of genius, the eye that is able to see and the mind that is able to understand amid all the thunder and confusion and excitement of battle. He saw a stretch of pines on the edge of a hill near the Henry House. He quickly marched his troops toward the trees, covering their front with six cannon, while the great horseman, Stuart, plumbed and eager, formed his cavalry upon the left. Harry felt instinctively that the battle was about to be restored, for the time at least, and he turned back to Colonel Talbot and the Invincibles. 
A shell burst near him. A piece struck his horse in the chest, and Harry felt the animal quiver under him. Then the horse uttered a terrible, neighing cry. But Harry, alert and agile, sprang clear and ran back to his own command. On the other side of Bull Run was the northern command of Tyler, which had been rebuffed so fiercely three days before. It, too, heard the roar and crash of the battle and sought a way across Bull Run, but for a time could find none. An officer named Sherman, also destined for a mighty fame, saw a Confederate trooper riding across the river further down, and instantly the whole command charged at the ford. It was defended by only 2,000 southern skirmishers whom they brushed out of the way. They were across in a few minutes, and then they advanced on a run to swell McDowell's army. The forces on both sides were increasing, and the battle was rising rapidly in volume. But in the face of repeated and furious attacks, the southern troops held fast to the little plateau. Young's branch flowed on one side of it, and protected them in a measure, but only the indomitable spirit of Jackson and Evans, of Bee and Bartow, and the others kept them in line against those charges which threatened to shiver them to pieces. Look, cried Bee to some of his men who were wavering, look at Jackson, standing there like a stone wall. The men ceased to waver, and settled themselves anew for a fresh attack. But in spite of everything, the northern army was gaining ground. Sherman, at the very head of the fresh forces that had crossed Bull Run, hurled himself upon the southern army, his main attack falling directly upon the Invincibles. The young recruits reeled, but Colonel Talbot and Lieutenant Colonel St. Hillier still ran up and down the lines, begging them to stand. They took fresh breath and planted their feet deep once more. Harry raised his rifle and took aim at a flitting figure in the smoke. Then he dropped the muzzle. Either it was reality or a powerful trick of fancy. It was his own cousin, Dick Mason. But the smoke closed in again, and he did not see the face. The rush of Sherman was met and repelled. Ty drew back only to come again, and along the whole line the battle closed in once more, fiercer and more deadly than ever. Upon all the combatants beat the fierce sun of July, and clouds of dust rose to mingle with the smoke of cannon and rifles. The advantage now lay distinctly with the northern army, won by its clever passage of Bull Run and surprise. But the courage and tenacity of the southern troops averted defeat and rout in detail. Jackson, in his strong position near the Henry House, in the cellars of which women were hiding, refused to give an inch of ground. Beauregard, called by the cannon, arrived upon the field only an hour before noon, meeting on the way many fugitives, whom he and his officers drove back into the battle. Hampton's South Carolina Legion, which reached Richmond only that morning, came by train and landed directly upon the battlefield about noon. In five minutes it was in the thick of the battle, and it alone stemmed a terrific rush of Sherman when all others gave way. Noon had passed, and the heart of McDowell swelled with exultation. The northern troops were still gaining ground, and at many points the southern line was crushed. Some of the recruits in gray, their nerves shaken horribly, were beginning to run, but fresh troops coming up met them and turned them back to the field. Beauregard and Johnson, the two senior generals, both experienced and calm, were reforming their ranks, seizing new and strong positions, and hurrying up every portion of their force. Johnson himself, after the first rally, hurried back for fresh regiments, while Jackson's men not only held their ground, but began to drive the northern troops before them. The Invincibles had fallen back somewhat, leaving many dead behind them. Many more were wounded. Harry had received two bullets through his clothing, and St. Clair was nicked on the wrist. Colonel Talbot and Lieutenant Colonel St. Hillier were still unharmed, but a deep gloom had settled over the Invincibles. They had not been beaten, but certainly they were not winning. Their ranks were seamed and rent. From the place where they now stood, they could see the place where they formerly stood, but northern troops occupied it now. Tears ran down the faces of some of the youngest, streaking the dust and powder into hideous, grinning masks. Harry threw himself upon the ground and lay there for a few moments, panting. He choked with heat and thirst, and his heart seemed to have swollen so much within him that it would be a relief to have it burst. His eyes burned with the dust and smoke, and all about him was a fearful reek. 
He could see from where he lay most of the battlefield. He saw the northern batteries fire, move forward, and then fire again. He saw the northern infantry creeping up, ever creeping, and far behind he beheld the flags of fresh regiments coming to their aid. The tears sprang from his eyes. It seemed in very truth that all was lost. In another part of the field, the men in blue had seized the Robinson house, and from points near it their artillery was searching the southern ranks. A sudden, grim humor seized the boy. Tom, he shouted to Langdon, what was that you said about sleeping in the White House with your boots on? I said it, Langdon shouted back, but I guess it's all off. For God's sakes, Harry, give me a drink of water. I'd give anybody a million dollars and a half dozen states for a single drink. A soldier handed him a canteen and he drank from it. The water was warm, but it was nectar. And when he handed it back, he said, I don't know you and you don't know me, but if I could, I'd give you a whole lake in return for this. Harry, what are our chances? I don't know. We've lost one battle, but we may have time to win another. Jackson and those Virginians of his seemed able to stand anything. Up, oh, boys, the battle is on us again. The charge swept almost to their feet, but it was driven back, and then came a momentary lull. Not a cessation of battle, but merely a sinking, as if the combatants were gathering themselves afresh for a new and greater effort. It was two o'clock in the afternoon, and the fierce July sun was at its zenith pouring its burning rays upon both armies alike, upon the living and upon the dead, who were now so numerous. The lull was almost welcome to the men in gray. Some fresh regiments sent by Johnson had come already, and they hoped for more, but whether they came or not, the army must stand. The brigades were massed heavily around the Henry House, with that of Jackson standing stern and indomitable, the strongest wall against the foe. His fame and his spirit were spreading fast over the field. The lull was brief. The whole northern army, its lines were formed, swept forward in a half curve, and the southern army sent forth a stream of shells and bullets to meet it. The brigades of Jackson and Sherman, indomitable foes, met face to face and swept back and forth over the ground, which was littered with their fallen. Everywhere the battle assumed a closer and fiercer phase. Hampton, who had come just in time with his guns, went down, wounded badly. Beauregard himself was wounded slightly, and so was Jackson, hit on the hand. Many distinguished officers were killed. The whole northern army was driven back four times, and it came a fifth time to be repulsed once more. In the very height of the struggle, Harry caught a glimpse in front of them of a long, horizontal line of red, like a gleaming ribbon. It's those zoovies! cried Langdon. Shoot their pants! He did not mean it as a jest. The words just jumped out, and true to their meaning, the Invincibles fired straight at that long line of red, and then reloading fired again. The Zuvies were cut to pieces. The field was strewn with their brilliant uniforms. A few officers tried to bring on the scattered remnants, but two regiments of regulars, sweeping in between and bearing down on the Invincibles, saved them from extermination. The Invincibles would have suffered the fate they had dealt to the Zuvies, but fresh regiments came to their help, and the regulars were driven back. Sherman and Jackson were still fighting face to face, and Sherman was unable to advance. Howard hurled a fresh force on the men in gray. B and Bartow, who had done such great deeds earlier in the day, were both killed. A northern force under Heitzelman, converging for a flank attack, was set upon and routed by the southerners, who put them all to flight, captured three guns, and took the Robinson house. Fortune, nevertheless, still seemed to favor the north. The southerners had barely held their positions around the Henry house. Most of their cannon were dismounted. Hundreds had dropped from exhaustion. Some had died from heat and excessive exertion. The mortality among the officers was frightful. There were few hopeful hearts in the southern army. It was now three o'clock in the afternoon, and Beauregard, through his glasses, saw a great column of dust rising above the tops of the trees. His experience told him that it must be made by marching troops. But what troops were they, northern or southern? In an agony of suspense, he appealed to the generals around him, and they could tell him nothing. 
He sent off aides at a gallop to see, but meanwhile he and his generals could only wait, while the column of dust grew broader and broader and higher and higher. His heart sank like a plummet in a pool. The cloud was on the Federal flank, and everything indicated that it was the army of Patterson marching from the Valley of Virginia. Harry and his comrades had also seen the dust, and they regarded it anxiously. They knew as well as any general present that their fate lay within that cloud. It's come fast, and it's growing faster, said Harry. I got so used to the roar of this battle that it seems to me alien sounds are detached from it, and are heard easily. I can hear the rumble of cannon wheels in that cloud. Then tell us, Harry, said Langdon. Is it a northern rumble or a southern rumble that you hear? Harry laughed. I'll admit it's a good deal of a fancy, he said. Arthur St. Clair suddenly leaped high in the air and uttered at the very top of his voice the wild note of the famous rebel yell. Look at the flags aloft in that cloud of dust. It's star and bars. God bless the bonny blue flag. There are our own men coming and coming in time. Now the battle flags appeared clearly through the dust, and the great rebel yell, swelling and triumphant, swept the whole southern line. It was the remainder of Johnston's army of the Shenandoah. It had slipped away from Patterson, and all through the burning day it had been marching steadily toward the battlefield, drummed on by the thundering guns. Johnston, the silent and alert, was himself with them now, and aflame with zeal they were advancing on the run straight at the heart of the northern army. Kirby Smith, one of Harry's own Kentucky generals, was in the very van of the relieving force. A man after Stonewall Jackson's own soul, he rushed forward with the leading regiments and they hurled themselves bodily upon the northern flank. The impact was terrible. Smith fell wounded, but his men rushed on, and the men behind also threw themselves into the battle. Almost at the same instant, Jubal Early, who had made a circuit with a strong force, hurled it upon the side of the northern army. The brave troops in blue were exhausted by so many hours of fierce fighting and fierce heat. Their whole line broke and began to fall back. The southern generals around the Henry House saw it and exulted. Swift orders were sent, and the bugles blew the charge for the men who had stood so many long and bitter hours on the defense. "'Now, Invincibles, now!' cried Colonel Leonidas Talbot. "'Charge home just once, my boys, and victory is ours!' covered with dust and grime, worn and bleeding from many wounds, but every heart beating triumphantly, what was left of the Invincibles rose up and followed their leader. Harry was conscious of a flame almost in his face and of whirling clouds of smoke and dust. Then the entire southern army burst upon the confused northern force and shattered it so completely that it fell to pieces. The bravest battle ever fought by men who, with few exceptions, had not smelled the powder of war before, was lost and won. As the southern cannon and rifles beat upon them, the northern army, save for the regulars and the cavalry, dissolved. The generals could not stem the flood. They rushed forward in confused masses, seeking only to save themselves. Whole regiments dashed into the fords of Bull Run and emerged dripping on the other side. A bridge was covered with spectators come out from Washington to see the victory, many of them bringing with them baskets of lunch. Some were members of Congress, but all joined in the panic and flight, carrying to the Capitol many untrue stories of disaster. A huge mass of fleeing men emerged from the Warrington Turnpike, throwing away their weapons and ammunition that they might run the faster. It was panic, pure and simple, but panic for the day only. For hours they had fought as bravely as the veterans of twenty battles, but now, with weakened nerves, they thought that an overwhelming force was upon them. Every shell that the southern guns sent among them urged them to greater speed. The cavalry and little force of regulars covered their rear, and with firm and unbroken ranks retreated slowly, ready to face the enemy if it tried pursuit. But the men in gray made no real pursuit. They were so worn that they could not follow and yet they scarcely believed in the magnitude of their own victory, snatched from the very jaws of defeat. Twenty-eight northern cannon and ten flags were in their hands, but thousands of dead and wounded lay upon the field, and night was at hand again, close and hot. 
Harry turned back to the little plateau where those that were left of the Invincibles were already kindling their cooking fires. He looked for his two comrades and recognized them both under their masks of dust and powder. Are you hurt, Tom? He said to Langdon. No, and I am going to sleep in the White House at Washington after all. And you, Arthur? There's a red line across my waist where a bullet passed, but it's nothing. Listen, what do you think of that, boys? A southern band had gathered at the edge of the wood and was playing a wild, thrilling air, the words of which meant nothing but the tune everything. In Dixie land I'll take my stand to live and die for Dixie. Look away, look away, look away down south in Dixie. Ah, so we have taken their tune from them and made it ours, St. Clair exclaimed jubilantly. After all, it really belonged to us. We'll play it through the streets of Washington. But Colonel Leonidas Talbot, who stood close by, raised his hand wearingly. Boys, he said, this is only the beginning. End of chapter 16 End of The Guns of Bull Run A Story of the Civil War's Eve by Joseph A. Altscheller Recording by Michael Packard of Western Colorado